session of the Portland City Council. Good afternoon, Carla. Could you please call the roll? Good afternoon. Fish? Here. Hardesty? Here. Udaley? Here. Fritz? Here. Wheeler? Here. We'll now turn it over to legal counsel who will tell us a little bit about the rules of order and decorum. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Portland City Council. The City Council represents all Portlanders and meet, meets to do the city's business. The presiding officers preserves order and decorum during the city council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about a subject. You may also sign up for the public testimony on resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. If it does not, you may be ruled out of order. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist, if you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When you have 30 seconds left, a yellow light goes on. When your time is done, a red light goes on. If you're in the audience and would like to show your support for something that is said, please feel free to do so with a thumbs up. If you want to express that you do not support <clears throat> something, please feel free to do a thumbs down. Please remain seated in council chambers unless entering or exiting. If you are filming the proceedings, please do not use bright lights or disrupt the meeting. Disruptive conduct such as shouting or interrupting testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Thank you for helping your fellow Portlanders feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. Thank you very much. So yesterday we heard items 294 and 295. We heard testimony on those items. We continued those items to today to hear public testimony. Just to be clear, neither of these items are emergency items, so we won't actually be taking a vote today. We'll be hearing public testimony and then taking a vote at a later date. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Udaly. Commissioner Udaly. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. Read, back the yeah. oh, the title again. read the titles. Even with Sorry. a con uh, continued item? Uh, it is a new session. I suppose we should read the titles. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go, go oh. for it. Why not? Okay. 294, add evaluation of applicants for dwelling units to include renter protections in the form of screening criteria regulations. 295, add security deposits prepaid rent to include renter protections in the form of security deposit regulations. Commissioner All Day. right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Carla. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day to be here. Um, 
As the mayor explained yesterday, we heard a full presentation on our fair access and renting proposal. And we heard from invited, we had invited testimony from people who were actively involved in creating that policy or advising us. Most of them were supporters, some of them were not. I know that many of you didn't have the opportunity to attend that session or to watch it online, so I want to take a couple minutes to catch you up and provide some helpful information that may guide your participation today. First, we heard from many community experts about the complex nature of providing housing in the city and how a lack of standardized screening creates an environment where discrimination is prevalent but almost impossible to prove. We also heard testimony about how the landlord industry has not evolved to treat tenants as complex humans with a variety of circumstances, but rather as algorithms of risk. The most compelling testimony we heard in that regard came from Tyrone Poole, founder and owner of One Up Oregon. Tyrone laid a marker down for property management companies to start thinking differently about how they treat tenants who may experience temporary difficulties in their life and to become more acquainted with them as people instead of numbers on a spreadsheet. He demonstrated through data that the barriers of access to housing are real, and while our policy dramatically increases access to housing, it won't increase access for everyone. I'm going to repeat something I said yesterday. We're not asking private market landlords to become supportive housing providers. We're not suggesting that people who cannot succeed independently uh, in housing without supportive services should, um, landlords should be required to provide housing to them. We're proud of the ways, well, I'm going to skip that part. Second, I want to dispel a few myths about the intent of this proposal. If any of you are here, and I thought I had an assistant. Oh, here we go. Um, if any of you are here because you received an advertisement similar to this, I need you to know that the information you have received is wholly inaccurate. It is offensive and it is intended to scare tenants and landlords away from supporting reforms that actually make us all safer. I'm a renter, a woman, a mother, a policymaker, and a survivor of violent crime. I would never propose regulations that made our community less safe. Here's what you need to know. We cannot dictate any specific screening criteria that prevents a landlord from denying an applicant. Our proposal does not remove any requirement to screen for criminal history or any other barrier. Rather, our proposal offers landlords a choice between two options. Option one, they can voluntarily choose to adopt the low barrier set of criteria outlined in the code. This criteria is based on data that supports a more accurate and equitable assessment of what constitutes risk in an applicant's history. It allows landlords to screen for all barriers, including criminal history, but puts research-based parameters around what the landlord would agree not to deny housing for, including misdemeanor offenses that occurred longer than three years ago and felony offenses that occurred more than seven years ago. I encourage each of you to look into the research we provided to support these criteria. Um, and what I didn't mention is that, where's Jamie? Uh, because so many people weren't able to be here yesterday or see the session online, my offices created an FIQ and provided some additional supporting documents. You can get one in my office, you can get one from Jamie, and Jamie is also available throughout this hearing to answer any questions you may have. We want to hear from everyone, supporters and opponents, but we want to hear um, on the real issues at hand, not testimony based on fear-mongering by uh, landlord lobbyists. The second option, uh, if a landlord doesn't want to use a low barrier criteria, is they can set whatever criteria they want, 
but they must adopt the individualized assessment model instead. That is a best practice recommended by fair housing uh, federal guidance. What the, that means is that if they intend to deny an applicant for any of their criteria, landlords must allow the applicant to provide evidence that they, they have mitigated or improved any of the housing barriers, such as a low credit score, uh, criminal history, or prior eviction that they are being denied for. The landlord will still be empowered to make the final decision about uh, whether the applicant is right for their property. They just have to provide information to the applicant about why they are being denied and what the specific non-discriminatory business interest reason is that the landlord has determined a basis for denial. This process is already outlined in federal guidance, as I mentioned, supports the Fair Housing Act and should be familiar to many landlords. The second item I'd like to address um, is there are other reforms in the package that will help tenants, uh, help decrease barriers to housing for renters. We have lowered the income ratio to two times the rent, so they won't be denied from housing because their wages, stagnant wages, as we all know, have not came, kept up with dramatic increases in rents. We also changed how landlords can assess the income of applicants who have rent subsidies or vouchers to make it less likely uh, tenants will have to give the vouchers back when they fail to find housing that's affordable to them. We've provided a preference policy for applicants who experience disabilities that require accessible units. We have opened the door to a wide variety of different forms of identification for those that don't have official government ID. We have set caps on the amount a landlord can charge for a security deposit. We have set new standards on what they can charge for items broken or damaged during a tenancy, and we have dramatically increased the amount of information your landlord will be, or landlords will be required to give in a number of different circumstances. In other words, we built this proposal to help, not hurt. I want to encourage everyone here to testify accurately, and as I mentioned, we have the FAQ that should resolve some of the confusion that's been fomented in the, in the community. Finally, I want to address my colleagues. I realize that we are asking you to contemplate a complex proposal that you did not spend the last two years of your life meticulously working through. I understand the people's, that people's fears of the unknown are compelling, and I simply ask you to carefully scrutinize what you hear today in light of what you heard yesterday. What we are proposing can lead the way in this country toward greater housing access, which is a basic need a human right, a finite resource, and something that we are obligated to provide access to. And with that, I will turn it back over to the mayor. Very good. So we have a little over 60 people who are signed up to testify today. Uh, I gave the commissioner uh, an option, Commissioner Udaly, and the option was we either limit testimony to two minutes and keep the list open, or we allow people three minutes and close the list. She opted for the latter, so Carla will close the list at this point. We will allow three minutes for testimony. We only need your name for the record. We don't need your address unless you choose to give that. When you come up to the microphones, the microphones move around about six inches is the right distance. Please leave the microphones on. When, once they're on, just leave them on for the next person. You will see a yellow light come on when you have 30 seconds left to testify. The red light will come on indicating your time is up. So please be respectful of that. Don't make me the microphone police today. Let's all be respectful of the fact that there's lots of other people behind you who will want to testify. We have a long-standing tradition in this chamber that people with small children or people with disabilities or other extenuating circumstances should be allowed to go first. Uh, if that applies to you, if you could just see Carla. Carla's our, our very able clerk here, and she will move you to the front of the list. So with that, Carla, please call the first three. Mayor, I'm sorry. Commissioner Udaly. I have to read a couple um, 
minor amendments before testimony be begins so that the public can include them uh, in their responses. Commissioner Daly. Thank you. I want to thank my colleague, Commissioner Fritz, for sending some helpful language clarifications uh, to us to include in our policy proposal. The two amendments I offer today are intended to make the policy more understandable. Just as a reminder, I also offered two different clarifying amendments yesterday, so what I'm presenting today will be considered Udaily Amendments 3 and 4. Udaily Amendment 3. In the screening criteria policy, amend section D.1. Point B, to say permanent resident card or permanent resident alien registration receipt card. That's a mouthful. Um, and you daily number four in the screening criteria policy amend section E1A6 and seven to include the language excluding court mandated prohibitions that are present on the property for which the applicant has applied. And that's simply to clarify that if an applicant has a prior conviction on their record and they were released with specific conditions of where they can and cannot live, that our policy does not supersede that. The um, conditions would prevail. Thank you. I'll Sorry. second those. Uh, Commissioner okay. Fritz seconds those. Uh, we'll keep those on the table and open along with the first two amendments which were proposed yesterday. So with that, Carla, name the first three, please. The first three are Jesse Dillon, Clyde Holland, and I believe it's Koya Crespin, and they'll be followed by Yvette Marinotz, I believe it is, Janet Newcomb, and Mary Seip. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Welcome. Thanks for being here. I should, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, if anybody needs to come up first, please come and let me know. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jesse Dillon. I'm a landlord and I'm very concerned about the future of property management and the price of housing in Portland and the surrounding area. I apologize, I'm probably gonna talk fast because I have a lot of material to cover. The proposed city ordinance 30.01.086 is not necessary. Government fulfills the role of doing for the people what they cannot do by themselves. I do not see this mission being fulfilled by the city council with regards to this ordinance. As written, it will lead to higher rental rates in Portland. There is poorly written language that leaves industry professionals like myself, quite frankly, confused. I'll keep it short, but most of the ordinance requirements are either federal or state law, or currently best practices in the industry. I'll refer to the impact statement prepared by Jamie Dumel from the City Council's website. Outcomes establishes first come first serve for applicant processing. It's already covered in the Oregon State Law ORS 90.295, Section 6. Unless the applicant agrees otherwise in writing, a landlord may not require payment of an application screening charge when the landlord knows or should know that rental units are available at that time, that no rental units are available at the time or will be available within reasonable time frame. If a landlord requires payment of an applicant screening charge but fills the vacant rental unit before screening the applicant or does not conduct a screening of the applicant for any reason, the landlord must refund the applicant <clears throat> screening charge to the applicant within a reasonable time. Outcome number three, requires preference for applicants with mobility challenges to be matched with units that are ADA compliant. The Civil Rights Act of 1968 and the Fair Housing Act prohibit steering. That means that landlords' hands are tied. We cannot tell a person that's mobility challenged that they're better off in a mobility challenged apartment. We can't do it, it's illegal. If a tenant sues us for steering them, it costs the landlord $10,000 per instance. Number four, allows for many different forms of identification beyond government issued IDs. The Federal Trade Commission um, has put out a directive titled Fighting ID Theft, a how-to guide for businesses. In it, it, it asks businesses to make sure that they have a picture government issued ID when doing business. The average cost if there were a fire in any of my apartment homes is about $100,000 to restore. 
when I have an applicant that comes in with a Microsoft Word typed um, letter saying that they are Joe Smith or John Doe or whomever, I'm not going to rent to them because it's too risky for me to put them in my $100,000 unit. Number five, lowers Excuse the me. income to rent ratio. We will take um, additional testimony in writing, so you're welcome to send that and we're not going to be voting today. Thank okay, you. thank you. Carla, if, if somebody just has one sheet of paper that they're working from and they choose to leave it with you, can we get copies then distributed to all of us? Is that an option? Certainly, I'll get those okay, to you. Okay, so if, if people didn't bring enough for all of us, if you give it to the clerk, she'll get it to us. Great, we thank appreciate you. It. And thank I promise you. I'll read it. No problem. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Clyde Holland. So I've prepared a letter which you should, you should be given a copy of. I gave it to the clerk. <clears throat> Uh, we fully support rental housing. We also support affordable housing. In each of the projects which we've developed here in Portland, the three that are going, we have 20% set aside for affordable housing. Notwithstanding that, looking at the fair uh, criteria, we have some grave concerns. First, HUD, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac all require that we screen three times the rent in order to be in compliance with their financing. To mandate a criteria that is lower than that will put landlords in default on their mortgages. In order to attract institutional equity to be able to build new projects in Portland and thereby uh, provide uh, additional housing, we're required to screen three times income in order to access institutional equity. In order to look at the compliance aspects of the very confusing pages that have gone here, our estimate is it will take two, it'll take one person per 100 units to be able to review and deal with the compliance and the challenges. That will raise rents over time on Portlanders approximately $65 per unit per month. The cost of the claims that the first testimony had is also significant when trying to address this individual assessment, the risk of claim that a landlord didn't handle things appropriately is extreme. That risk is estimated at $25 per unit per month. So in order to just comply with the regulations, we're looking at approximately $100 per unit per month, which over the 125,000 renters in Portland will cost about $125 million a year to provide from a compliance standpoint. Lowering the credit, if that is required, will substantially increase the credit losses for, re for tenants. That increase in losses will have to be passed on in order to qualify for new rental units. Several aspects from a separate standpoint. The policy layering effects of inclusionary zoning, of the tenant relocation, and registration and now these have substantially lowered the ability for us to access uh, debt and equity. It has cost the city of Portland about $5 billion of uh, investment in housing. We're missing about 12,000 units. We only have nine to 15 months worth of work left of pre-IZ housing and the significant drop off, there's no uh, anticipation of um, coming. I've included a letter and an article on Japan, which has had no rent increases since 2000, and um, the policies there from that standpoint, I'd ask to be done. In total, we ask that you submit this for an economic analysis so that you can look at real impacts on Portlanders, because we're concerned that the impacts are going to substantially hurt, not help the Thank policies. You. Thank Excuse you. me, before you leave. Uh, thank Commissioner you, Mayor. Um, what is your definition of affordable housing? Can you tell me what income somebody would need in order to afford the affordable housing units that you referred to? Yes, ma'am. Um, we have set aside 20% of our projects at 80% area median income. So area median income is 72.5, so that would be right around 55 to 57 that they would need in order to be able to afford to live there? Ma'am, I don't have the specifics. What we have is there are different projects in different areas, and so they vary. 
but that's the calculation, and I trust your, your judgment. I'm not that, that quick at math, but I, I was trying I to do it on the fly. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Awesome. Good afternoon. Um, thank <clears throat> you for your time. My name is Koya Crespin. I am here in support of the Fair Access in, rental, in Renting Ordinance. <clears throat> Excuse me. I currently work at Community Alliance of Tenants as the Portland Metro Community Organizer. I work with tenants daily who are unable to find housing. This is directly due to the current inequalities of the Wild West style screening criteria that is currently used by landlords. Tenants who don't have proper identification are completely shut out. I have family members who are experiencing discrimination after serving their time in prison or jail only to come out and face recriminalization when they search for housing. Members of society whom have paid their debt, only they are not seen that way. This system is not viable for the most impacted members of society. I have been getting emails from tenants who are receiving emails from their landlords talking about this very ordinance. These landlords are using scare tactics in these emails that they send to their tenants to try and compel their current tenants to testify against this ordinance. And I can forward you all those emails that I've been getting. Um, currently, I, mean, I find that very disrespectful and disgusting. Cur currently, I myself am a single working mother. As a tenant, I consider myself to be the backbone of my landlord's investment. When I was no cause evicted out of my home six years ago, I could not find a place due to income requirements and I was working 40 hours a week plus. Um, I tried to get a co-signer. My co-signer would have needed to make five times the rent to co-sign for me. This system of shutting out low income people can no longer continue. I would also like to mention the inequality of this hearing. A suggestion would be to give more ample lead time for working tenant families to be able to attend these hearings, as well as holding evening sessions to make attendance possible for low income, most, work, most impacted working families. Um, thank you for supporting the Fair Access in Renting Ordinance. This is a much needed and overdue step towards a more balanced housing policies in Portland. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. Next three, please, Carl. Next three are Yvette Morantz, <coughs> Janet Newcomb, and Mary Seip. And they'll be followed by Dan Hayes, Alan Kessler, and Marai Allen Clare. Good afternoon. OK, my name is Yvette Maranoski, and I'm here in, in support of this proposal. I ask that you guys support that as well. Um, it, it's fair to. I have to go my bullet points. It, um, to, to, uh, if a person applies and they qualify, they should be housed. That's fair. It's, it's also fair if they have uh, um, ID that works, it's functional. Um, it's, it's fair to accept that if it's, if it's valid. And um, it's fair to not have too high of a bar of income uh, that's unreasonable, you know, that, 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 um, that will uh, discriminate against people. That's, that's not fair. So I, I don't support doing that. And, and it's also, one second. right, it's um, for the, to allow the landlord the flexibility it's still their choice to to look at criteria um, for credit history, like like having a history of paying rent. That I mean, that absolutely should be counted. There's no reason why it shouldn't be counted. So, and they they don't have to count that, but just they're given the choice of it. That's very minimal. So I wanted to say that, and 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 um, and I um, I my little story is that um, I I. Um, I approached the housing situation, and um, the the whole process was so adversarial and difficult that I didn't even try. And I stayed I stayed homeless for like ten years, raising a child, and um, and that didn't that wasn't easy either. And 
And um, so it, it really is um, a difficult process and it really needs to change. And I wanna point out um, something that, um, a few things that, some numbers that, I, I mean, I don't have the numbers, but, but some um, facts um, about, that, that are not having to do with Fannie Mae or dollar signs or anything like that. But there, um, there is a reality that um, there, the, the, the danger is, the real danger is in people who are stressed out from all of the rental process and everything, the wraparound stress. People who are born w with predisposed to dying of a heart attack, uh, the, you know, um, because, of inter gen because of trauma that happened 20 y generations ago. And, and, you know, that's the danger right there. And you, I mean, the people are dying of that, and the doctors will document that as a heart attack, and they they won't document it as the 20 years of um, trauma that, or the 20 um, um, generations. They won't document that, they, but that's the reality that people are dying of right now. Right now, it's not a, 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 a made up thing, and um, um, this and some. Is it yellow or red? Your time it's was done. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Appreciate it's, it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being okay. here. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Hello. My name is Janet Newcomb. I've been a landlord for many years. I have 19 rentals here in Portland. Yesterday, Tyrone Poole of One App testified that 60% of the rentals in Portland are the smaller mom and pop operations, such as myself. By voting in these proposed laws, you will be driving many of us away from Portland. I think you underestimate just how many rental units will be lost. I, for one, will be looking to sell 18 of my 19 units here. The proposals are cumbersome to implement and will cost us all time and money. This will result in higher rents for the tenants. We cannot be expected to absorb the costs for acting as social workers. We as landlords expect to be able to verify who is going to live in our units. It is not the fault of the landlord if someone does not have the proper government issued ID, which most of us require. Yesterday, one of your invited speakers voiced her, excuse me, voiced her concern on this issue. She was then bullied to the point of tears by Councilor Hardesty. Shame on you. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to be able to screen all the prospective tenants and not just a designated head of household. I need to know who I have living in my units. As an example, if three people move in and a month later the designated head of household moves out, I would have two people living in my apartment that I know nothing about. Are they sex offenders? Are they murderers? Do either of them work? Do they make enough money to pay the rent? I won't know. I want to provide a safe environment for my tenants. I can't do that if I don't know who is residing in my buildings. Your intent to remove the security measures that I have in place will not benefit the tenants. Your proposal states that I will not be able to turn down someone for a credit score of 500. You say a credit score does not indicate tenants' ability to pay. Although my decision is never made solely on credit score, it may play a vital role in my denial of the tenant if they have charge off after charge off for consumer debt. I look at the reason for the low score and make allowances for certain things such as student debt and medical bills. You are now removing my ability to turn down someone who simply is not responsible enough to pay their bills. I own rentals in South Carolina. My evictions there always involve tenants with low credit scores. You mentioned yesterday that a policy like this does not exist anywhere in the U.S. Don't you think that there might be a reason for that? You have made this hearing about disparate impact and prejudice. From my perspective, it looks like prejudice is against the owners of rental properties. You are not categorizing cleaning as normal wear and tear and we will now not be able to charge the tenant for this cleaning. Dirt is not wear and tear, it is simply laziness on the part of Thank the you. tenant. Wow. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, my name is Mary Seip. Commissioner Udaley, thank you for bringing this proposal forward and thank you for scheduling this special session dedicated strictly to public testimony. It was a great idea, thank you. do it again. <laughs> I strongly support this proposal. Yesterday's presentation was complete and comprehensive. 
Kudos to all of the staff and volunteers who worked on this proposal. Jamie Duhamel's presentation was possibly the best staff presentation I have seen. Great work, Jamie. I figured out that I've spent 56 of my 71 years on this earth as a renter. 16 of those years were living with my parents who rented. So I think that makes me a bit of an expert on this subject. While I understand some of the concerns of landlords about administrative challenges with this proposal, I believe that it's appropriate to require some level of social responsibility on the part of housing providers. I'm confident that their concerns can be addressed. Renter and landlord rights and protections have evolved very slowly in our country and in this state. I remember vividly in the 1980s when I was a single parent how difficult it was to find a home that would rent to people with children. In 1988 or 89, the law changed and landlords could no longer refuse to rent to people with children. Some of you may not remember that restriction. I remember hearing how devastating this new law would be to landlords. Here we are 30 years later and we've all survived. The affordable Section 42 income restricted building where I live changed ownership last year. One of the changes in eligibility that the new owner implemented was that being convicted of a felony is an automatic rejection. It wasn't before. Also, if an applicant has more than $1,000 in delinquent debt, it is an automatic rejection. When a person's been convicted of a felony and they've served their time and paid their debt to society, they should not continue to be punished and denied employment and housing. How can they ever be expected to get their life back on track with these types of barriers? Jamie showed in her presentation how credit history is not a valid tool to predict if an applicant is likely to pay rent. Rejecting an applicant because they have $1,000 in delinquent debt is ludicrous, especially in low-income housing. When someone experiences a financial crisis, and I've experienced three of them in my lifetime, they pay their rent before they pay their credit cards. As wages flatten and the cost of higher education rises and corporate sponsored pension plans cease to exist, we're going to see more and more people on, in low paying jobs who can never afford to become homeowners. And they, will require, and they will end up retiring with Social Security as their only source of income. The need for affordable and fair access to housing is going to grow and we need the mechanisms in place to provide fair housing to a growing percent of our population. This is a step in the right direction, and I support this proposal. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mary. Next three, please, Carla. Next three are Dan Hayes, Henry Kramer, and Mariah Allen Clare, and they'll be followed by Mike Wessling, Ali Sayer, and Ian McKenzie. Good afternoon. Would you like Good to start, afternoon. please? My name is Dan Hayes. I'm an owner of rental properties and someone who serves landlords, and we fundamentally believe that Fair access to safe housing is a right. All, all landlords that I know, myself included, want their units filled, filled consistently. And the reason we screen is to give our clients and ourselves and our tenants the best chance for success. I'm asking you to vote no on this overreaching and complex proposal. I want to be clear that I'm not asking you to vote no on improving the standards that landlords must follow for screening tenants. For the last 20 years, if you operate a boat in the state of Oregon, you have to take a basic safety course. I've always been surprised that a landlord can manage a rental property, screen tenants with very little requirement for education. I also find it surprising that one of the best things that Portland does is provide a one-day landlord training class each year. In fact, my entire staff goes each year might surprise everybody in the room to know that that class actually hasn't been scheduled this year, and I think that's sad. I'd ask you to vote no on this proposal, but say yes to establishing standards that ensure fair access through education as well as policy. Go back. It's taken a year and a half because it's complicated. It's hard to do. I'm asking to send the team back. An incredible amount of work has been done, but send them back simplify the proposal, give those 60% of self-managing landlords a chance to learn how to be better landlords and support them in that way and then implement your policy. It'll give you time to find the money. 
It'll give you time to offer more solutions from people in the industry. I would ask you also to consider, not believe me, but consider the possibility of the complexity that you've introduced into this industry. Between February and the end of May, I will have spoken to in excess of 1,000 realtors through a continuing education credit requirement, and I speak on tenant landlord law. I can tell you the number one anecdotal thing I hear from realtors are the businesses that the business that they're getting from landlords that simply no longer want to provide housing. We're not keeping up with the demand today. I don't believe you know just how severe this supply will be if you continue to introduce complexity without providing training and solutions on how to execute your policy. Even in the light of rent control, I believe Portland will become one of the most expensive cities to rent in. Of my 26 rental properties, 100% of them are in Portland, and I'm confident of a successful business model because of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, colleagues, I've had a request from the audience. Um, the request is this. Can we request that folks not stand up during testimony? I'm not able to see the closed captioning or the commissioners. Is, is that something we can live with today? Um, so if, if you hear somebody that is saying something you strongly agree with, just give a really big thumbs up, and I, I promise you we'll look up and we'll see it. If you can't stand what they're saying, thumbs down. <laughs> uh, I get a lot of those personally, so I don't mind. Um, but instead of coming up and standing, if we could do that, just to respect the folks in the audience who need to be able to see the closed captioning, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Henry Kramer. Uh, I'm a, I live in uh, the King neighborhood of Northeast Portland. As a homeowner and a small landlord, I strongly support the proposed fair standards. I've rented two homes, uh, two rooms in my home uh, for the past five years. Immediately before that, I served for several years as a property manager in the same neighborhood. In that time, I've screened and rented to nearly a dozen people. Uh, based on that experience, I believe these reforms will support stable housing for tenants without causing undue hardship to landlords. This proposal is pretty plainly about putting Portland on the side of people of color and other middle class and working class people. Right now, the landlords, landlords are allowed to discriminate in a wide variety of unnecessary ways and erect needless financial barriers to entry for, for prospective tenants. That's immoral. It's evidence of a deeply broken housing system and it is fixable without adding any serious burden, any real burden, to fair, ethical landlords. These reforms will help ensure that nobody's denied a home because they were victims of mass incarceration or predatory capitalism, and it'll help guarantee that security deposits aren't used as a way to surreptitiously discriminate against low-income people and people of color. These should not be controversial ideas in the city of Portland. I've had many great tenants and a few iffy ones, and each one's personal history, individual history, be it financial or personal, had no meaningful bearing on their conduct as a renter. There were good, reliable tenants who lived hard lives and could barely make ends meet, but always paid rent on time and always respected the house. And there were spotty tenants with long time, well-paying jobs and pristine pasts who would regularly break things and trash the house and pay rent late. The types of invasive background investigations that are currently allowed today would not have helped me predict who would be good and who would be bad. Honestly, relying on those investigations would have mostly misled me. If it's possible at all to predict the quality of a tenant, there's nothing a landlord would need to know that isn't permissible under the low barrier evaluation standard. Now, there are people who will fearmonger in bad faith about the new mild limitations on discrimination based on criminal or credit history. Those opponents will prey on the misconceptions they hope you have about people with criminal convictions or weak credit. They hope you don't know that old convictions have no connection to rental outcomes after seven years, and a criminal record is no predictor of future criminal behavior. And they'll hope you don't think about the families who've declared bankruptcy because they had a, a medical calamity without health insurance or fell victim to predatory lending in the lead up to the Great Recession. And if we're being truly candid, the big landlords hope you don't know any people with felony convictions or bankruptcies because if you do, you know the vast majority of them are hardworking, inspiring people who are rebuilding or have rebuilt their lives after a catastrophic event. A longtime neighbor of mine served time for a nonviolent offense some time back, the sort of thing that big landlords want to use to deny housing. Um, he used his time after prison to do community organizing and found a nonprofit and start a family. And denying him rent because that history is insane to me. Uh, and as for the security deposit reforms, they are so obviously mild and inoffensive as to barely warrant any comment at all, but you should definitely enact them. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and Portland City Council members. My name is Maria Lynn Claire, renter and tenant advocate. I appreciate the work that has been put forth into the FAIR proposal. I support many of its basic elements, allowing different forms of identification, lowering the income rent ratio to two times the rent, security deposit caps, the anti-discrimination look-back periods for criminal histories, which really uh, impacts people of color, uh, parameters for changing screening fees and returning fees if applications are not processed are essential money savers. Uh, the step one in it uh, with ID and income requirements are simple and straightforward, and I like simplicity. One significant issue for me, however, about the proposal is step two, which is focused mainly on debt and credit history as primary first measurements for assessing a tenant's worthiness for access to housing. I wondered why rental history as the main measurement was not foremost, not credit and debt load, even the landlords at the Rental Services Commission meeting agreed, we don't care about your Macy's card, they said. We want to know if you are going to pay the rent on time. And it's astounding to me how this essential category didn't even make the list. For long-term renters like myself with 10, 20, 30 plus years of solid rent payment history, this is our credit rating. For four years, renters have endured the abusive practices of rent gouging, burdened with paying 50 to 80% of their income for rent, then having to run up balances on credit cards to pay for groceries, medicines, daycare, multi, multiple moves after being rent evicted several times. This has happened to me. And still, we're having to qualify over and over again, risking disqualification over debt as a means of survival before the very industry that has profited from our misery. For renters, these type of indignities equal injustice compounded. Not all renters require heavy screening. We, we need to find ways to simplify and tailor the process to the special needs of the various types of renters. My second concern is the proposal's complexity. I realize this is the first step attempting to standardize the application process, requiring transparency, notifications of why applicants are declined, and these are noble objectives that are important for bringing about more equitable housing opportunities for renters who have historically been locked out. However, creating a new vehicle from scratch is hard. Often mechanics require more time to perfect. Therefore, I would rather we take the time to pare down much of the complexity from 30 pages to 15, fine tune and simplify the content, and if fares to be meaningful, it has to be enforceable. Therefore, eliminate the gaps in enforcement. Make sure we have sufficient financial resources to carry it out, our mission, and I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. I appreciate it. Next three, please, Carla. Are Mike Wessling, Ali Sayer, and Ian McKenzie. And they'll be followed by Madeline Kovacs, Sue Scott, and Mark Rogers. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Westling. Uh, my wife and I own a single uh, rental property in Portland. It's a triplex in Montevilla. To be accurate, we own 50% of a triplex in Montevilla. My brother-in-law <laughs> and his wife own the other 50%. If there's a mom and pop landlord in Portland, we're it. Um, I don't take this investment lightly. This was a big, huge financial decision for my family. And it's something that we hope um, will help to pay for our kids' college um, someday if that's what they choose to do. At the same time, I think it's really important that we recognize that anyone who's in the position of owning a rental property benefits from serious financial privilege at a time when many in our community are facing serious financial challenges, um, even if they're working full time. When we bought our rental property, two of the units were vacant. One of them was in pretty rough shape, so we did a major renovation. Uh, we made a large investment in new flooring, carpet, countertops, and appliances. I spent many weekends and evenings doing work there myself. When the unit was ready, we put it on the market and worked with the first people who submitted an application. It was a couple with two kids who were looking for a larger apartment. Our unit has three bedrooms and three bathrooms, so it works really well for families or roommates. When we ran the credit report, we found out that they had very poor credit um, and a bankruptcy. But when we checked in with their references, we learned that they had always paid their rent on time and had been great tenants. And guess what? They're great tenants. Um, I'll be really clear. These proposed screening rules are absolutely not a burden. Um, they actually align with how responsible landlords and property managers should be treating applicants anyway. 
I also have no problem with the non-discrimination requirements regarding an applicant's criminal history. My take is that just because someone committed a crime in the past does not mark them as a horrible tenant for the rest of their life. People wonder why so many people in our community are experiencing homelessness, and one of the major reasons is that people who have almost any kind of criminal activity in their past cannot find a place to work or a place to live. And that's the real public safety concern that we should be addressing. At the end of the day, I'm not going to be selling this property just because I have to consider a wider pool of tenants. Thank you for considering these new rental screening rules. They will increase opportunity and fairness for tenants, and they aren't going to be a huge burden for small landlords. Plus. It's just the right thing to do. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of the Fair Access and Renting Ordinance. Uh, my name is Ali Sayre, and I'm a renter residing in Southeast Portland. Um, the City of Portland has been aware for years that we have a massive problem with discrimination in housing, especially against Portlanders of color. Discrimination, as Commissioner G. Daly said earlier, is almost impossible to prove often, and its victims frequently are unaware that it has taken place. Um, you know, as a, as a lesbian, I personally prefer the Westboro Baptist Church style overt bigotry over the performative allyship style homophobia found in Portland, because at least the Westboro Baptist Church is overt. Uh, Portland's racism, sexism, and homophobia are draped in a blanket of faux progressivism, which frequently makes progress almost impossible. The Fair Ordinance's tenant screening criteria are a rare opportunity for Portland to live up to its values and take concrete steps towards addressing racism and other forms of bigotry in our current practices. I, I wrote, I could imagine, but we've already heard many landlords objecting to that characterization. Um, however, the solution to addressing racism is not objecting to being called a racist. It is working towards ending racism. Uh, we all have unconscious biases, and having objective screening criteria that everyone will follow will reduce the influence those biases have. Security deposit reform is also badly needed. I just moved out of a rental house with a deposit of $2,000. My housemate and I gave the landlord the keys back a week early because he wanted to have the new tenants move in the day after our lease ended. After he found new tenants, he mentioned a couple landscaping things he wanted us to do before move out, which we did. When we did the walkthrough, he said everything looked fine. So I was pretty surprised when a month later, he deducted $500, or 25% of our deposit, for yard work, gutter cleaning, and dump fees. If we had been told there was a problem, we could have easily remediated it in the week, uh, in that week for much cheaper. But the fact is, under current Oregon law, the, the language around security deposits is incredibly vague and unclear, and my housemate and I have no idea if we will successfully be able to get the rest of our deposit back. And to add insult to injury, I work right by the house, and I know that no landscaping was actually done. My story is one of thousands of examples of Portlanders who have had their security deposits stolen by their landlords. Portland City Council has a chance today to pass an ordinance that would clarify Oregon's vague language and make it much less likely for deposits to be stolen in the future. Please protect vulnerable renters and pass the fair ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Ian McKenzie, and I'm here to support the fair access and renting ordinances. Last night, I managed to listen to most of the invited testimony. Uh, I'm glad I did, as it gave me a much better understanding of how much work has gone into crafting these policies and how many good reforms are included. There's so much to support, but I'd specifically like to talk about how this policy affects people with criminal histories. There's a growing recognition that America incarcerates far too many of its people for far too long, and that this disproportionately affects communities of color. Changing this is going to take sustained efforts at the federal, state, and local levels. One of the few good things to come out of Washington recently was the First Step Act, a relatively modest but nonetheless important reform to the federal prison system. The fact that that passed with overwhelming bipartisan support shows that we're ready to move away from the fear-mongering of the past. Like many people, I have friends and family members that have served time in jail. I think of them when I say that even if somebody has done something that caused real harm to others, they shouldn't be punished for the rest of their lives for the, re for the worst thing they've ever done. Once someone has completed their sentence, they need to be successful in finding housing, just as we all do. Otherwise, they're in a cycle where they can't move on from their past, and that has negative consequences for everyone in our community. 
Last November, I hosted an election night party at my home. There were wins and losses in the races that my friends and I were paying attention to, but we were all excited when it became obvious that Amendment 4 was passing in Florida. 65% of Florida voters said that the right to vote should be restored to someone with a felony conviction once they've completed their sentence. In effect, the voters were saying, you've done your time and now you're welcome back to society. And if I have one hope for Portland, it's that our city council can be at least as progressive as the voters of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> so with that thought, I urge you to vote yes on FAIR. Thank you. Thanks, all three of you. Next three, please, Carla. Are Madeline Kovacs, Sue Scott, and Mark Rogers. And they'll be followed by Kathy Rogers, Seth Levens, and Mary Beth Steele Hutchinson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Would you like to go ahead and start, please? Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Wheeler and council members, my name is Mark Rogers. I've been an, an owned rental uh, property in the city of Portland for over 30 years. My wife Kathy and I manage our own properties. We assume all the risk and liability associated with being a rental property provider. From personal experience, I also understand the plight of tenants with credit challenges and criminal backgrounds. My deceased brother was a convicted sex offender. Once he was released from jail, our family struggled to secure housing for him and his family. Both property owners and tenants are stakeholders in this process and deserve to be served in a way that provide protections for both. I see the city as Portland as not only being the entity that drives policy to make this happen, but also has a, as a key stakeholder in the process. Commissioner Hardesty <coughs> commented yesterday we need to partner with the city and tenants to move this policy forward. In my mind, when we talk about partnering, that means everybody takes responsibility. Certainly, property owners and tenants have. What I don't see is where the city of Portland has any skin in the game. You provided no tools or instructions for either side once this policy has been implemented that has an opportunity for success. Commissioner Fish stated yesterday his concern was implementing a policy that puts tenants at a higher risk of failure. Mr. Poole from One App noted that this policy has the opportunity to create a wider door for tenants to go through. However, once the, they are through, are the systems in place to promote their success and the success of landlords in serving them? This could cause more follow-up of already vulnerable tenants and small landlords. I believe in trying to provide solutions. I propose that to have responsibility and skin in the game, the City of Portland figures out how to take an intermediary role between property owners and tenants. You would take on the responsibility in helping credit challenge tenants or tenants with prior records go through a process or a certification for a lack of a better word, where the city becomes a co-signer or sponsor for those tenants. If those tenants fail to comply with the terms of the certification, then the city of Portland would be responsible to make the property owners whole. The city could also help tenants without ident proper identification, verify identification, and provide a, a rental ID card that validates their identity for property owners. Mr. Poole from One App stated yesterday that 71% of all declined applicants could have gained ac acceptance with a co-signer. I believe we all have responsibility to look outside the box and strive to find a balanced solution for all stakeholders in, to this issue. In, map, in my mind, this scenario provides that everyone at the table is taking on some risk and liability. If we're going to partner together to bring reform, then we all need to bring something to the table of value to make it happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Sue Scott. and. Um, most of the commissioners I see here today came into office as activists, and I applaud that. If we can make a difference in a community, I think we should. Uh, however, now you're commissioners, and that means that you're charged with listening to all citizens, not just those who have supported the issues that brought you here today. It's your duty to represent a balance of your citizenry. Everyone's vote, everyone's voice, everyone's view should count, and their perspective should be respected and given just weight. Over the past several months, I've attended and testified at the handful of public hearings related to landlord-tenant regulations and Senate Bill 608. What I saw with SB 608 was that after all the public input that was there, the, the new regulation was passed exactly as is. There wasn't a change in a comma or a period. To me, that doesn't sound like representation that's collaborative or representative of both sides. The best solutions, as we know, happen when both sides give a little. Yesterday's hearing sounded more like, a, the, sa more like sa the same attitude from the city. Nothing will change from the current proposals is my speculation. 
objections were cut off, some speakers were berated, and one was made to cry. Well, the commissioner gave deference to supporters and took ample time to tell their own personal stories of their experiences, they would delete time from other speakers. Donald Trump would be proud. One of the most frequent criticism I've heard regarding how this process has moved forward is that the city has not listened to a broad spectrum of those affected by the regulations, in particular rental providers. Last year, uh, Multifamily Northwest received a grant from the well-respected and community-oriented foundation, the Meyer Memorial Trust, and their work was to lower barriers for tenants. And they plan to roll out this collaborative work uh, this year. But the city has ignored that and chosen instead, I think, to railroad through their own agendas. There are other solutions, too, that I think can work and help with affordable community, communities, but they, I think, are being ignored. Social impact investors are now putting together uh, projects with affordable units without public funding. That should be a standing ovation. But instead, uh, nothing's going, there's nothing going on with that. Rental providers must have a seat at this table for solutions to be equitable and, re and reasonable. 60% of providers are a small investors, and the small investors are the ones whose livelihood and future retirement depend on good relationships with tenants. It's the big companies who are actually the ones that have caused the problem. They can afford to follow the new rules and adjust rents accordingly, and they'll be especially happy with the 10.3%. If you want more big property management companies in Oregon who never bend a rule for a tenant or a circumstances, then carry on. Everyone loses, including your tenants. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Madeline Kovacs, and I'm testifying today as a senior outreach associate with Sightline Institute and as a resident of North Portland in support of the Fair Access Ordinance. Those of you who have heard me testify on housing issues before have all heard about the need for zoning reform, building more housing, and the need to better support nonprofits working to deliver affordable housing in Portland. But removing barriers via zoning reform and increasing support for affordable housing is incomplete with also addressing barriers to fairly accessing housing. We must work to remove a wide range of barriers to housing opportunity that, together, will begin to make headway and begin to address the scale of our housing crisis. There does not have to be insidious intent for a policy to have discriminatory impact, and we know the impacts here. The same people who suffer from discriminatory land use and financial policies in housing also frequently suffer from discrimination and application of, screen of screening criteria. Again, this happens whether intentional or not. We have a chance to dismantle a clear barrier to housing for impacted communities, and we should take it. If you have heard me testify on housing issues here before, you also know that I wouldn't be here in such staunch support of the measure if I thought that it would have a significant impact on housing supply or owners' ability to fill their buildings with tenants. I believe this, these concerns in this case are outsized compared with the actual content of the policy. In this case, landlords may have to do a little bit more legwork, and sure, a few people might be deterred from becoming landlords. That's okay, and as you heard previously, pretty unlikely. It's also not an unfair burden to ask that people do more legwork to maintain their business. It is unfair not to reassess policies that we know result, intentionally or not, in disproportionate impacts on people with little to no legal or financial recourse for whom loss of housing might mean loss of a job, loss of health, or loss of life. The FAIR policy is thoughtful and is appropriately tailored to address discrete problems. We have good information about what the policy will do. There was beta testing that demonstrated the effects of the policy very clearly. If you care about housing justice, there is absolutely no reason that you should vote no today. Yes, we need to ensure that we won't make our underlying housing shortage worse and put upward pressure on prices. But we must also take measures that will benefit people experiencing housing insecurity and yes, discrimination. This is a very clear yes today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all three. The next three are Kathy Rogers, Seth Levens, and we've uh, had a change up. We're gonna go with Sarah Wines. She may not be available right Im immediately. And after them will be Bar Mary Beth Steele Hutchinson, Dennis Satchel, and Mark, I'm uh, sorry, Mike Fives. Very good, thank you. Good afternoon, would you like to start please? Sure, my name's Kathy Rogers. Uh, my husband and I provide affordable housing. Um, we have a property in Hawthorne and our units uh, 
rent for an average of $850 a month. So we are the type of uh, unit providers that the city of Portland is looking for. We have provided one unit free of charge to a tenant um, for now nine years who would otherwise be homeless. Um, so we're not evil landlords. We're caring people who are trying to make ends meet um, in a locally run small business. Typically, the applicants that come into our building often come in with a backpack, and they are ready to move in right away. We do screening quickly. We take one applicant at a time. We don't charge um, screening fees if we already have somebody uh, pending. We are usually able to give somebody an answer within a couple of hours, and they often move in the same day. This ordinance, though well-intended, would change all that, and I think to the detriment of both property owners and tenants. The increased time frames, the documentation, the required reporting, the depreciation schedules is completely unrealistic. Uh, Mr. Poole from one app yesterday pointed out in his testimony that small property management companies um, will have a difficult time implementing this ordinance. Well, if a small company has a problem implementing it, think about an owner manager of which I learned yesterday provides 60% of the units in the city of Portland. We have full-time jobs, and we manage our apartment units on top of that. I don't have a staff of people to do this. Um, there was also much discussion yesterday about tenants being able to afford um, rent with only income of twice the rent. Um, I can tell you that if a tenant comes in and has rent, uh, income of only twice the rent, but has a clean credit history, I would rent to them all day long. Now, if a tenant comes in with only twice the income in rent, uh, twice their rent of income, and has a troublesome credit history and ongoing credit problems, I can tell you from personal experience that tenant is going to have a very difficult time paying their rent. When a tenant can't pay their rent, we rarely evict them, as they were talking yesterday. We don't go through that process. We try to do it the friendly way. We allow the tenant to break their lease, move out, find an affordable property, but make no mistake, we take that financial hit. We lose the rent for a month or oftentimes more. Um, as I said, we're not evil people. Um, we care about our tenants, and I believe that we are representative of the vast majority of the owner managers out there. I urge you to vote no on this proposal in its current form. Um, I urge you to consider the ramifications for all people involved. Um, thank you. Am I done? Or? Yeah, thank oh. you. And okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Seth Levins, and I'm a, a retired electrician. Uh, I've acquired over the years three apartment houses, three little apartment houses. I've um, worked that direction all my life. And uh, I have uh, two tenants been with me 30 years. Uh, half of them been with me over 10 years, probably an average of eight, eight years on a turnover, so I have good people. Our goal has always been good neighbors because I'm the manager, so now I'm discovering that, that uh, my good neighbor policy is an error, and uh, uh, I'm a little confused. I'm, I'm incredibly impressed that everybody's been able to read uh, all this and understand it. I've read it uh, uh, numerous times. I actually never was able to read all of it. It's very complicated. I, uh, I just opened up and looked at one, one sentence and just thought I'd stick with this one, trying to figure it out. A landlord may only screen heads of households. Co-applicants that are not responsible for paying the rent may be screened for criminal history and rental history, parentheses, only for violation notices issued to the household for conduct and uh, compliance within the last year and demonstrate they uh, created a, a hostile, unsafe, or harassing environment, or the terms engaged in discriminatory uh, conduct. Phew. Um, it's state law. It's, sorry. I mean, it's, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I've been reading electrical code, and actually, I prefer to read electrical code than, than this. Um, uh, before I, uh, I've been in construction my whole life, so I, I've met a diversity of people. I've been in the service and um, start out in the shipyards. And so it's been a long road. And, and the guys in the shipyards, um, the ex-cons said, Oregon was a good place to do time. Um, you don't want to do it in the South because the prison's pretty tough down there. Uh, so I've met, a, I've met a diversity of people. And um, some of those 
thanks criminals, are, are not quite as, uh, uh, as successful rehabilitating or modifying their behavior. When I was talking about modifying behavior, there's a, it's, I don't try to modify my tenant's behavior because it's something I'm not really licensed to do or I, I don't know how. So um, this th thing about, um, I think there's, maybe, I don't know if there's good criminals and bad criminals, how that works out, but uh, um, Commissioner Daly talked about uh, one, uh, two years history, and, and I'm seeing in, in print here one year history, um, looking back at the criminal history. And um, I guess it's my um, experience in life that makes me concerned that not all of this is good. And I hope you take a second look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is uh, Sarah Wines in the room? Sarah? I'll call her again if she makes it makes it over. I think so. We're going to go with uh, Mary Beth Steele Hutchinson, Dennis Satchel, and Mike Fevis. Good afternoon. Hi. I'd like to start, please. <clears throat> I have severe fibromyalgia and a problem with my vocal cords, where I really can't talk very well a lot of the time. So I recorded my testimony in advance. It's five minutes, well, four fifty-nine, and my husband wants to give me his time and I just wanted permission to play it, please. In this case, yes. Okay, thank you. thank you. So, I'm having minor technical difficulties here. I mean, can you hit play or? And, and just uh, while, while you're getting it, we, we, often, we often accommodate people can with certain circumstances. Can you go while we figure it out maybe? Yeah, we'll go ahead and start over here. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, good, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. it still is. Um, <laughs> Mayor Wheeler, members of the council. For the record, my name is Michael Fevis. My family has provided housing in Portland to uh, Portland residents for over 100 years. Our buildings are older and we provide housing to mostly lower and middle income people. Many of our residents are first time renters or are new to the job market. We have some residents who have been with us for over 30 years and are now on fixed income. We strive to keep our rents affordable, but it seems that every action that this city council takes only drives our costs up. It used to be that legal costs were negligible, less than a tenth of a percent of our income. But since you passed the relocation assistance law, we have seen our legal costs quadruple. This does not include the cost for additional management time to document and prepare for a for cause eviction. The proposed ordinances before you will drive up management and legal costs even further. I support the goal of making housing more accessible to more people but I urge you to take a step back. Slow this process down and carefully consider the unforeseen negative impacts that these ordinances may have. Many aspects of the ordinances are unwise and dangerous. For example, it is likely that the low barrier to entry will ultimately result in more evictions for non-payment of rent. The tenant will then be left with a judicial record that will prevent them from renting housing at all for many years. Another example concerns the limitation of credit screening to head of household. If the designated head of household moves out, the remaining tenants may not be able to pay the rent and they will be subject to a blemish on their rent history. In some cases, the two times rent or two and a half times rent income test makes no sense. For example, under the ordinance, it is, as it is currently written, if an applicant has a Section 8 voucher that covers all of the rent, and we have had some that do that, they would not have to show any income at all. How are they going to pay for food, clothing, and medicine? This is an expensive ordinance. By the city's preliminary estimate, it will cost half a million dollars to implement and upwards of $400,000 a year to administer. I suspect those numbers will go up when the actual numbers come in. This, I expect also that this ordinance will cost our company upwards of 1% of gross rent, and that probably will go up if I actually sat down to look at the labor involved. More importantly, every time you make it more difficult to manage and provide housing in this city, you drive the cost of housing up. In addition, I believe that these ordinances will reduce the housing supply in the long run. They are one more obstacle to development of new housing in the city. Many developers are going elsewhere where restrictions, permit fees, and legal costs are less. 
I urge you to delay on this issue. The only Thank thing you. worse Thank than you. not taking action is to take the wrong action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Okay. I'm going to play what I recorded this morning. as an apology for having my testimony pre-recorded. Please enjoy my meme plagiarizing live performance because this is literally my business. I want it. For almost 20 years, I've been a landlord in Portland. I know. Boo, y'all hate me. This is real work, though, and I find it hilarious. They all think people should do this for free just because people need housing. People need food, too. How many of y'all work in restaurants? I never claimed to be a professional even sober. I told people simply that I would put them in a room, including utilities, for about 500 a month if they don't cause any problems. I'm proud of what I've done, and I think I've helped a lot of people. Most of my clients help me when they seem out and about or even taking their money. I'm really good at picking people who get along, so much so that countless friendships and a dozen babies have been born for people I chose to live together. Everyone has their preferences, but mine lead to two to three times protected classes in my housing versus the city average. At first, PTU was unsure if their idea would affect me. Their leadership suggested that I let roommates pick new clients to get around this. My clients trust me and have not often taken me up on offers for a couple hundred off their rent if they find a new client when someone moves out. They don't always have a friend who needs a place, so this could put me in a position to be forced to find a business reason not to rent to a litigious jerk. Mom and pop operations like mine don't have the time, energy, or lawyers to polish this turd for all the courts. If it's not intended to include shared housing situations, the ordinance should very clearly say so. My clients have tried to speak up to PTU to let them know this is not a good idea. A little half dozen of them at the block are pointing out this in their PDX Tenants Unite group. Most were given no reason for being excluded, but my brown tenant was thrown out by a white guy in PTU for supposedly being racist. Arguing against this law is the only way he can have any say in who lives with him and his children. Right now it's my decision that I share it with him. He trusts me and is happy with his housing and the four different people who have shared a kitchen and bathroom with him in the years he's been a victim of my Ponzi's when we asked how he's being racist, we were told anyone arguing against this law must be. I think these people have good intentions, but have created an echo chamber of only angry renters. Renting someone a room or even an apartment is a leap of faith. Mom and pop operations like mine are the most intimidated by finding a legit business reason not to rent to people who are simply a jerk. I've had people grab my ass during walkthroughs, hit on the other tenants, even drop an in-bomb, and then still want to live with people of color after they find out that the price includes utilities. These are just the kind of litigious little beep who PTU would help sue me for not renting to them. This is especially sane for, insane for rooms for rent, but I don't think any private owner should have to deal with all this garbage. If the owner is going to collect the rent and manage it themselves, they should be able to decide who they literally are on call for. This is not the same as making someone a sandwich. It seems to me that they're already trying to shut down this kind of housing. I'm not going to throw, if I'm going to throw someone out, the roommates have formed a coup against them and everyone wants them out. I've had the kind of passive aggressive people who stop doing their dishes or even flushing the toilet after they asked to leave. 90 days is a long time to deal with a roommate gone bad. I haven't had to do this yet, but I'm sure it will be a mess for everyone. I'm told to do four cause evictions, but that isn't going to work unless I can prove someone is being a jerk. Are we supposed to film them leaving the bathroom or something? This is the kind of housing that simply cannot exist for long without reasonable access to no cause evictions. Making it harder to get someone out makes us not want to accept people who might be a problem. Someone in Portland Renters Unite is already bragging that they are seeing if they can annoy their landlord into paying a relocation fee because they want to move. They've cultivated their group so anyone who ever suggests that not fucking a landlord over like this is quickly removed. In the echo chamber, they can't see that they are hurting people who are helping the problems that you claim to want to solve. Some of the people I rent to now own houses and have friends living in their garages on the cheap. In the housing emergency, these people should get medals, not fined. Inspecting all rental housing will end this kind of agreement and put a lot of people on the streets. Do you guys really think it's a good thing when you put someone on the street because their window is too small or their room is unpermitted? A lot of people are renting two-bedroom houses with bonus rooms and children's bedrooms and what are supposed to be offices. Y'all gonna stop that too? PTU is being shady. I don't think most renters want inspections. Not from the landlord, not from the city, not from anyone. I have never had a tenant inspe request an inspection. Why not just be straightforward and say this is the plan? I ask about this on their site and they say, say, say simply that these protections help renters. I'm not so sure. They say inspections will check for smoke detectors and they know that this is a lie. Not all landlords are the devil. I'll never forget a landlord begging Miss Ulity to be responsible and she replied by telling him that she needs to call her permissioner Ulity. If there's one thing she taught me, it's to plug your zine when you have an audience. I'm opening Sunlord Apologist on the Twitter and the YouTube 
This testimony is the first video. I think it's time that you listen to us small landlords and maybe leave these crazy rules to people who hire professionals to manage their investments. Private owners already give a lot more slack, but we need to be able to have a choice. We already have a well-earned reputation for being lenient. Leave us the frog alone, please, and furthermore, I ask that you rethink applying these apartment rules to us. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry, you already spoke. Thank you. I do it again. No, thank you. It was good the first time. It was really good. <laughs> Next three, please, Carla. Okay, we're on number 22. Uh, we're going to go with Stephen Marks, Keith Schultz, and DeAndre Robinson. And they'll be followed by Chris Wynn, Mar Mariah Hernandez, um, and Warren J. Stubblefield. Would it be possible for me to defer until Commissioner Fitch, Fritz returns? Excuse me, Fish returns. I'd like him to hear my comments. Would that be all right? Uh, my name is Stephen Marks. Call someone else. Oh, you will just start over here then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You can stand by for him. You just stay there, and he'll probably be back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Willer and the members of the City Council. Um, my name is DeAndre Robinson. I work for the Urban League of Portland as a housing specialist. Uh, I wanted to be as professional as possible, but I need to get a little personal. Um, when I came in here, uh, somebody said that I look like a thug, quote unquote. And if you're a black man, uh, that's literally one of the worst things you can call somebody without normal. Um, and mm. so since a lot of people here love uh, background checks, let me give a background check on myself. Uh, I am a graduate from Temple University. I have a 3.5 average from Temple University. Uh, I've never been incarcerated, uh, um, and I've never been kicked out of my own apartment. Now, speaking of incarcerations, my older brother has been, and without him, I would never be where I'm at right now. So thank you to my older brother, and he's with me right now, well, not here, but in Portland right now, and he has been incarcerated, and it's hard for him to do a lot of things like rent, get jobs, and stuff like that. So again, this wasn't writ written on my, on my paper, but I wanted to say that um, for the record. So again, my name is DeAndre Robinson. Uh, I'm here to ask you to vote yes for the fair screen uh, or, uh, ordinance. Again, I'm the housing specialist on, of, at the early Urban League of Portland. My mission as a housing specialist is to help the African American community to find and maintain housing for themselves. Um, if this ordinance passed, this could help um, my, my participants uh, find and find stabilized housing, stabilized housing, uh, and help them uh, find great living situations. So please vote yes on this fair screening ordinance. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Wheeler and Councilors. I'm Keith Schultz. I'm a 65-year-old native Oregonian, and I've lived in the Portland metropolitan area for 45 years. And I've rented apartments for that whole time, but I'm now homeless. Thanks to the people I have volunteered with for the past 10 years, I have a roof over my head. But my uh, first eviction came in 2017, the day after Relo passed. And since it was in Gresham, I had no recourse. And I found a place a few blocks away from my former residence, but I'm on a Section 8 voucher, and the, uh, there was a glitch in the uh, paperwork, and I got my first lockout by the County Sheriff's Department three weeks before I moved into my new place. And then they found out that I help out a few homeless people and give them a place to shower and just kind of get off the streets for a few hours, and. They didn't really like that too well. And so um, then um, that prompted the complex to install a camera outside my apartment for other reasons, but they were able to monitor everyone that came into my apartment. And, uh, and they wouldn't renew my lease So because of all that. I began searching, but it was denied because of the previous eviction the one in 2017. And each time was another 40 or so dollars, and I was able to stay until January 19th when I got the uh, second lockout. 
And um, I have two evictions in two years, and I think I should uh, correct that. I have two evictions in 45 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon, Thank sir. You. Uh, my name is Stephen Marks. My company is Portland Historic Properties. We own 41 rental units in two buildings uh, in the inner city, specifically in Mount Tabor. At yesterday's work session, I learned that 40% of rental units in Portland are managed by property management companies and 60% are owned and managed by the little guys like me. If you take away one thing from my testimony, let it be this. If this bill passes, Portland will lose hundreds of landlords like me who simply lack the capacity to navigate the systems and procedures this bill creates. We will give in and hire management companies to do this work. There are so many complexities and ambiguities in this bill that the fear of being sued for triple damages and attorney fees will require us to hire companies to do this professionally. The ultimate irony here is that if the bill passes, rents will rise. The cost of hiring professional help, of paying for lawyers, and of potentially dealing with lawsuits will be passed along to our renters. For landlords like me, and there are a lot of us out there who really care about keeping rents affordable, that hurts. Random thoughts from yesterday's work session. The income to rent ratio in the bill is illusory. It only considers pre-tax income. Using post-tax income, which represents reality, the ratio is a recipe for failure for renters and landlords. The bill is predicated on the idea that landlord discretion is a bad thing. That is not true. Discretion in choosing tenants creates flexibility. When you remove discretion, you get inflexible screening criteria, which automatically excludes the classes of renters we've heard from. Discrimination, the real enemy is economic discrimination. Most of the problems we heard about yesterday stem from folks who just can't afford housing. And this bill doesn't do one thing to address that problem. By raising rents, it will exacerbate it. There is a simpler fix to the problem of renting to applicants with criminal histories. Create a protected class for that group as you would any other protected class under FHA guidelines. If you are really inclined to try this model, why not try it on government assisted housing first and see if it works? I hope each of you will read the bundle of letters I submitted on the record and delivered to your offices from my tenants. I sincerely believe that the vast majority of renters in Portland do not support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all three of you. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry, next three, please, Carla. And good afternoon. <laughs> the next three are Chris Wynn, Mariah Hernandez, Warren J. Stubblefield, and they'll be followed by 28, 29, and 30, Bill Stevenson, Andrea Debnam, and Felipe Hernandez. Good afternoon, sir. Would you like to start for us, please? Yes. Good Thank afternoon, you. Mayor Wheeler and uh, City Commissioners. My name is Warren Stubblefield, and I am in fear of the uh, screening audience. You know, I'm in fear of it. I'm, re I'm representing the Urban League because I am a tenant of the Urban League. I'm in fear of it because I've lived homeless. I've lived homeless for over 16 years. I've just recently obtained a place four months ago. I tried and tried to get a place to stay. I was turned down. I, it, was, it was just horrible. What it did in my life, it created depression. That, that depression is the enemy of success. It led to alcohol, it led to drugs. I've been clean and sober now over two years. It just destroyed my life of not having nowhere to stay. It makes a difference when you have security. Then you can find identity and you can find purpose. Yeah, I was a suffering, suffering black individual out there with nowhere to stay, living in streets, sleeping in porta potties. I mean, it was disastrous. Of course, it led to self-medication. But now that I've changed, I hate to see anybody else go through what I've been through. It makes a difference when you're able to rent. It makes a difference when you have that right to feel like somebody. It breaks your heart when you know 
that you're going to sleep outside, when you have nowhere to go, when you can't afford it. When I, I get SSI, but I'm saved now. I want to see somebody else be saved. I'm hoping that you consider voting in favor of this because it can save lives. And that's the biggest issue, humanity. It's not just about my color or your color or their color. It's about us helping one another. And I believe in this audience. I believe that it will help. I believe that it will change somebody and save somebody's life because I was there and I do have a clear understanding of what it is to live on the streets, what it is not to be able to afford some housing, not to even get an opportunity to get it with a criminal background. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to express how I feel about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor uh, Ted Wheeler and commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Maria Hernandez Segoviano, uh, Policy and Advocacy Manager at Opal Environmental Justice Oregon. I am here today to indicate strong support for the Fair Access and Renting Ordinance uh, before you. First of all, I want to take a second and thank you, thank actually all community members who are in the audience who are here today in support of this housing rights and, just, and justice. We know that a lot of us uh, and a lot of individuals in grassroots and advocacy community and, and members desperately wanted but couldn't be here. Not only because they didn't want it and they decided not to be here, but many of them are too busy working two jobs to afford their rent to begin with. Others who are directly impacted by the lack of affordable safe housing aren't here because they can't afford to take time off work. And then there are those who have simply been pushed farther and farther away off the fringes from this city hall itself that planning to be here would have just been a nightmare trying to coordinate who takes care of their children, who they stay with, or simply they can't afford to take the multiple trips in transit. So thank you all, uh, and, and they know who they are. Yellow stickers. Uh, Opal works on the intersection of transportation, housing, and health in our communities, representing our members who live in the, on also on the intersection of being transit riders and renters, and who due to their economic status, disability, age, or legal status, often are denied the basic human rights, such as housing. It is clear that the question of who gets to live where and why is rooted in economic, social, and racial injustice. And therefore, this ordinance makes it clear that it is time for justice. Renters, especially those who are low income and communities of color, face multiple challenges in finding stable, safe, and affordable housing. Housing costs are the greatest expense in household budgets, thus limiting the ability of low income and individuals to meet other vital needs, such as food, utilities, and health related expenses. As a former farm worker myself, it amazed me to hear that the, uh, from uh, the quick math that Commissioner Hardesty made that simply affording to live somewhere you have to earn between 55,000 and 60,000 when the average income of a farm worker annually is 26,000. So that just in framework was really, really um, disheartening. Additionally, people with criminal records suffer from pervasive discrimination in many areas of life, including employment, housing, education, and eligibility. Such records also disproportionately impact African American and Latinx folks who are more likely to have criminal record. For example, right, the fact that an African, African male is incarcerated at a rate more than six times than a white men is shocking. So ultimately, uh, because time is running out, uh, we are in a housing crisis where more than 47% of renters make up the city population. We must remove barriers to access and create the type of policies that are co-created by communities who are the most impacted by the issue. The proposed ordinance before you today could give hundreds of our environmental justice communities a fair shot to uh, access the city of Portland. The ordinance is also a fair and it's great step for applicants' right to housing to be considerably uh, consider against all screening factors. I ask you, in fact, I urge you to please pass this ordinance today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mayor, commissioners, thank you for taking the time to hear me. Uh, I wanted to start with a couple of concerns about the proposal, the, the ordinance as it's written. And this ordinance creates, oh, I'm sorry, my name is Chris Wynn. Uh, this ordinance creates a needlessly complex process, the subjectivity of which is a fair housing catch 22. Property owners are going to find it difficult to comply with this subjective individualized assessment. While not appearing at odds at, uh, with the existing fair, housed, fair, fair housing tested objective uh, screening practices in place. Perhaps more troublesome is the potential that this ordinance creates for renters to overextend themselves. This ordinance will encourage renters to spend 50% of their income on housing, creating a city mandated subprime renting crisis, for lack of a better term. 
This predatory policy is going to lead to a marked increase in FEDs and damage to credit and rental histories. When considering the many competing priorities uh, for city funds and time, I encourage the city council to also understand that there are stringent fair housing laws in place and the ethical and professional property managers uh, intensely observe these, these laws. Contrary to the narrative built to support this ordinance, there are housing options available to everyone regardless of their history. I do wanna close with two personal notes. My stepfather was convicted of felony possession with intent to distribute, and he served two years in Mississippi State Penitentiary. He moved to Portland in 2018. Uh, while there were some doors closed to him, he was able to find suitable housing within 15 days. Another concern that I have is based on a personal experience. Um, in the 1980s, my parents lived in an apartment community in Metairie, Louisiana. My mom is white, my dad, as a refugee immigrant from Vietnam. Uh, a skinhead white supremacist emblazoned in swastikas became our neighbor. And one day when my dad was coming home with groceries, this man flung a beer bottle at his head, knocking him down the stairs. He called him a chink and he proceeded to beat him up. My mom contacted the police and this man was arrested. And in the process of him being arrested, she found out that he had already served time for felony battery for aggravated battery. And I just think that perhaps if that community had proper screening in place, maybe my father wouldn't have been a victim of a hate crime. Thank you. Thanks all three. Thank you. Next three, please. Next three are Bill Stevenson, Andrea Debnan, and Felipe Hernandez. And they'll be followed by number 31, 32, 33, Max Smith, Nancy Grief, and I'm sorry, 34, is Cheryl Dalton. Thank you. Would you mind starting? Hola, buenas tardes, mi miembros del Consejo Municipal. Mi nombre es Felipe Hernández. Soy representante del Grupo de Acción de Vivienda de Culi. Gracias por su atención y su presencia. Les voy a leer una carta firmada por los miembros del Grupo Chat. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. My name is Felipe Hernandez. I am here representing the Cully Housing Action Team. Thank you for your time and uh, your attention. I'm gonna read you a letter that was signed by the members of CHAT, the Cully Housing Action Team. Estimados miembros del Consejo Municipal de Portland, el equipo de acción de vivienda en Cully, CHAP, es un grupo de base hecho de inquilinos residentes de los parques de casas móviles y dueños de casas en el vecindario de Culi. Trabajamos juntos para avanzar nuestras metas sobre la vivienda accesible y los derechos de inquilinos y para prevenir el desplazamiento de nuestros vecinos. Dear Portland City Council, the Culi Housing Action Team, CHAT, is a grassroots group of renters, mobile home park residents, and homeowners in the Culi neighborhood. We work together to advance affordable housing, anti-displacement, and tenants' rights goals. Apoyamos fuertemente la ordenanza de acceso justo para inquilinos FIRE y recomendamos que lo adopten. Creemos que esta póliza mejorará mucho el, ex, el acceso a la vivienda para personas de color, personas de bajos ingresos, personas viviendo con discapacidades y otros miembros de nuestra comunidad que enfrentan barreras sistemáticas en el mercado rental existente. We strongly support the Fair Access in Renting Ordinance and call on you to adopt it. We believe that this policy will greatly improve access to housing for people of color, low-income people, people living with disabilities, and other members of our community who face systemic barriers in the existing rental market. In se September 2018, members of CHAP trabajaron juntos para generar una lista de retos que hemos enfrentado para accesar vivienda en alquiler Juntos con soluciones propuestas a estos retos, el documento con esta lista está adjuntado a esta carta. Estamos muy contentos ver que muchos de los problemas que mencionamos se solucionarían con la póliza propuesta de FIRE. Creemos que este es un paso adelante muy importante para inquilinos en Portland. 
In September 2018, CHAT members worked together to generate a list of challenges we have faced in accessing rental housing, along with proposed solutions to these issues. Please see the attached document that is, was just distributed behind the letter. We are very pleased to see that many of these issues were, that we raised are addressed by the FAIR policy. We believe this is an important step forward for renters in Portland. Sí. Por favor, voten sí para adoptar esta policía. Sinceramente, miembros de CHAP. Gracias. Please vote yes to adopt this policy. Sincerely, members of the Cully Housing Action Team, CHAP. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mayor Wheeler and City Commissioners. Uh, my name is Andrea Debnam, and I'm here offering support for the Fair Screening Ordinance. Uh, I'm also here on behalf of the Portland Community Reinvestment Initiatives, otherwise known as PCRI. Uh, PCRI, PCRI is a nonprofit community development corporation, has been a provider of affordable housing and associated services uh, in North and Northeast Portland for over 1,000 low to moderate income families for over 25 years. Uh, while our portfolio of those we house and serve are diverse, we have historically housed a large percentage of black households. Uh, we know historically issues around fair and equitable access to housing for black community has not been favorable, much of which we're unfortunately still grappling today. Uh, as a culturally specific, competent organization, we know firsthand the barriers that exist uh, for black and low income people and have intentionally created an eligibility process to accommodate what we know historically has kept this community from accessing housing. Uh, much of, of, if not most, of what has been proposed aligns with PCRI's current screening practices. Uh, while a good number of our properties in our portfolio are publicly subsidized and come with a predetermined set of requirements that must be adhered to, there are a significant number of homes in our portfolio that are privately managed by PCRI, giving us the ability to set our own guidelines. Uh, just to name a few convictions, uh, we're very intentional about not letting someone's criminal history prohibit them from being housed. A few number of applicants have had criminal records and have successfully become residents with no issues maintaining their housing. Um, income, as a matter of fact, we only require one and a half times uh, monthly income. Uh, and while we understand everyone can't do that, I think uh, setting a lower uh, limit to that is helpful and important in getting low-income families housed. Um, credit reporting, credit scoring. Uh, while we pull credit reports as a part of our uh, uh, screening process, it's not our practice that credit scores determine applicants' ability to pay rent. We're primarily looking at previous rental uh, history, but even then, that's not a reason to deny them. While applicants may have had unfortunate circumstances, completing a rent roll course or providing a certificate of completion is acceptable. Uh, lastly, uh, really in our best efforts to ensure we give every applicant the best opportunity to become housed, we want to make sure we offer them an op opportunity, if they've been denied, uh, an opportunity to appeal that decision. So we encourage people to uh, uh, get letters of recommendations uh, from social service agencies, character references, support letters, or simply really at, uh, encouraging the residents to be their own. Uh, advocate. Uh, oftentimes we've had people really just tell us why they deserve to be housed and why they deserve uh, another opportunity really can be sufficient. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mayor Wheeler and members of the council. My wife and I own a seven unit apartment in North Portland and for the past nearly 14 years have been providing affordable housing long before it became today's great need and cause celeb. I challenge anyone to identify any tenant of ours, past or present, who has been treated unfairly or who would be in the need of the provisions contained in today's agenda items. As a former legislator in both the Oregon House and Senate and as a former Oregon Labor Commissioner, I understand and appreciate your role in balancing public and private interests. But there is no balance in this package. I'd be willing to bet that no representative of Multifamily Northwest or any similar group took part in putting it together. In all my time of public service, I've never seen a bigger, more misguided ball of red tape rolling around in search of a problem. These items paint with a broad brush and say that all housing providers are not to be trusted to treat tenants fairly or operate the rentals responsibly. We think there are many small operators like us 
for years have been providing affordable housing who would be se severely impacted by 294 and 295. How many? You don't know. You're flying blind as the inventory is due April 15. Estimates 160 or 60 percent, but those are estimates. You may not know how many, though it seems prudent to know. Um, but these provisions are a major incentive to stop doing what we do. Rather than inflicting this draconian regimen on unknown numbers, why don't you actually do something to identify problems? For example, create a city tenant complaint office. You, the city, investigate the complaint. If it has merit, subject the offender to penalties. If not, why penalize uh, everyone absent need? This could be part of a carve out for small operators and would seem much less expensive than the bureaucracy envisioned to administer 294 and 295 based on cost figures provided yesterday. Incidentally, those figures should be shared with the public. 294 and 295 represent a full-scale assault on housing providers, especially small operating uh, housing, affordable housing operators. They tell us that you think you, rather than we, know better how to do our work that smacks a big brother, or in this instance, big sister. Their adoption would result in decreased housing, affordable housing, as many owners, including ourselves, seriously consider moving their equities to more receptive, less hostile locales than the city of Portland. 294 and 295 should be revised significantly, and if not, rejected. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Next three, please, Carla. Next three are Max Smith, Nancy Grief, and Cheryl Dalton, and they'll be followed by 36, 37, 38, Doug Klotz, Lauren Everett, and Seth Denlinger. Good afternoon, would you like to start, please? Sure, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Max Smith, and I'm the team lead of the Permanent Housing Program at the Urban League of Portland. Uh, I work with individuals who are formerly chronically homeless, um, <clears throat> our program, we follow a housing first model, which means that we screen in rather than screen out uh, tenants based on their level of vulnerability. Uh, we are proud of the work that we do, but unfortunately, the need for equal access to affordable housing exceeds availability. Passing this ordinance is a step in the right direction toward combating chronic homelessness and forming a more equitable framework for people in need of housing who have otherwise been screened out by landlords, and particularly for communities of color who are disproportionately and negatively impacted by current practices. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Nancy Greif. I'm 66 years old. I'm retired. Uh, but before I retired, one of the things I did was teach listening. And the first thing I want to say is getting to watch. Um, thank you for listening. I can usually spot it when someone's not, and you are. So thanks for that. That wasn't part of my planned remarks, which is just striking to me that you were really listening. Um, I'm also a mediator, so I'm trained to see both sides of an issue. Uh, I totally agree with the goals of this or these two ordinances. Uh, I've lived a number of places in the country. Portland is the least diverse place I've ever lived, and I miss the diversity. I miss the mix of neighbors I had in New Mexico, for instance. I'd like, in Selwood, my neighborhood's not very diverse at all. I'd like to see more diversity. I'm still going to urge you to vote no on both of these ordinances and go back to the drawing board because I think as they stand now, they're going to create higher prices and less diversity. Um, I've been a tenant more than I've been a landlord in my life, but I've been fortunate enough to be able to be a landlord of a single half of a duplex twice in my life. Um, as an aside, I never kept a penny of my tenant's security deposit with either of those properties. As an aside, I go over and plant flowers so it looks pretty for them. I really love being a landlord. Um, I try to do a good job. If this is passed, I will take my property off the market and let it just sit and appreciate because I'll be afraid to even sell it to somebody who might rent it out. There are two little girls next door. Oh boy. There's 
screening in place for head of household, but as many people have pointed out, anybody else in that house, the screening only goes back a year. Um, I'm not gonna put somebody whose background is a mystery to me next to those little girls who are across the street from the two little boys on that block. Um, so that's a major concern I have. Whether the concern is right or wrong, I think that's gonna be the perception. Perception counts for a lot. I, I have a PhD, the other thing I did was study economics. Perception drives prices as much as anything. Prices are gonna go up. There will be more evictions with this two times income because of the fact that we all pay taxes, we all pay for food. There may not be an absolute flood, but there will be more. Prices will go up. Landlords will perceive that they need to raise prices to cover their risk and costs in advance of any catastrophe. Um, I can't afford to have a lawyer do a walkthrough with me. I'm just small, small potatoes. So I'm hoping you vote no on both of these. Go back to the drawing board and thanks for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Dalton and I hope you will not vote for this screening criteria as it is written. Um, I've been listening to all the, the folks and um, a lot of really good testimony. And I do question why so many people that are working full time are not qualifying for housing vouchers. I want to know what we're doing to help people on a broader scale and to level the playing field. With the way I see it, there's a lot of burden on very few people. And I think we want to really work for common ground and um, ask the industry experts for their input. Um, the head of household um, portion is troubling. I do also worry about um, nefarious behavior occurring under that kind of, you know, little blanket there, um, you know, because it would be so easy for that person to leave uh, without us knowing. Um, the two times, you know, saying that people qualify just at two times and we know that the two times is based on gross and after taxes, it's very possible that over half of what this person is is making is, is just going to rent and what happens with the one little emergency. Um, I think we want to build people up, not break them down. And the way to build people up is by finding common ground. And I think, um, you know, housing vouchers is one of those ways, ways that we can really build people up, give them choices, you know, where they want to live. You know, rent control is really going to put people in very divided circumstances. We're going to see a bigger divide now between the haves and the have-nots. I, you know, have you, do you get the industry experts coming in and, and providing some direction for you? I mean, I feel like this is one-sided and we're not getting, um, you know, all points of view in this legislation that's being passed, not just this one, but ones that have been passed recently. So I think for the betterment of our future, we really need to have everybody come together. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all three of you. Commissioner Udaley. If I could just take a moment to clarify a couple things that keep coming up that are actually incorrect, and I'm just going to assume that there's confusion. Um, first, I want to make clear, and you can see in our presentation yesterday, the extensive engagement we did with housing providers, both affordable housing providers and private market providers. Jamie, my director of policy, um, met with the entire membership of Multifamily Northwest two times for four hours 
each or total? Four hours total. They spent a year debating our policy in the Rental Services Commission, and they participated in the beta test. And in fact, several of the changes we've made um, can, came directly from their recommendations. So while they don't ultimately support our policy, they were very, very heavily and meaningfully engaged. Um, as far as the confusion about heads of household versus non-heads of household, I made a amendment yesterday that corrects some confusing language. I just want to be clear about that. Non-heads of household would be screened, uh, and non-heads of households do not get to stay in the unit when the head of household leaves. They are not legal leaseholders, and um, they can also be required to sign conduct agreements. We've heavily vetted this with our attorneys. We wanted to make sure that landlords would not be burdened with trying to evict people that they didn't rent to in, in, their first, in the first place. Um, I'm, the question about the income requirement, when we require three times the uh, income, three times the amount of rent, we are talking about gross income, so it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be reasonable to require net income on one side and gross on the other, and I agree that uh, it's, it's uh, not an ideal way for tenants to live, but the reality is many of your tenants live live like that currently uh, because their rents have gone up over 60% in the last decade. So I said this yesterday, I'll say it again. I don't know why it's acceptable to prevent people from accessing housing because they don't make three times the rent. Uh, accept them in, but accept those who do into your household and then proceed to cost burden, into your rental and then proceed to cost burden them while they're there. So you're already housing the kind of people who are most likely to make it through our low barrier screening. Uh, they just became cost burdened and lost credit uh, score points because of the cost burdening that, was, that has happened to them since. I think those are the main things that came up that I wanted to, to correct because I can understand concerns about them and they're simply not part of the policy. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Udaly. I think I'll take this opportunity to also to address this um, perception that asking direct questions is somehow bullying people. Um, I ask very specific questions, and I expect people to be very specific in their answers. And I have been a policymaker and activist long enough to know when people are evading my question. And so I do not appreciate being called a bully. I don't like bullies, and I do not tolerate bullying behavior. However, I am an African-American woman who speaks directly, and I will continue to do so, and I will not be silenced. Next three, please. Next three are 36, 37, 38, Doug Klotz, Lauren Everett, and Seth Denlinger. And they'll be followed by Tony Jordan, Debbie Cabrales, and Raul Presadio Mendez. Good afternoon. Would you like to start? Hi, sure. Thank you. My name is Lauren Everett, and I'm here to share a story about helping my terminally ill mother apply for an apartment last summer when she was about to lose her housing. So this is a story about how a lack of screening criteria led to discrimination. So after a friend saw a for rent sign, I went over and met the owner's wife and toured the unit. I filled out an application for my mom, which she signed, and I submitted later that day. Since my mother was retired and on Social Security, I also included bank statements to show that she had a substantial savings and would be able to pay the rent. I also provided all the other documentation that was requested. The owner's wife did not process the application or give me any information about screening criteria, telling me that was her husband's job. The application was in their possession for a full week, at which point I was informed they were going to host an open house. As a tenant advocate and someone with knowledge of landlord-tenant law and fair housing law, I thought this was strange, but I came during the appointed time as requested and met the owner. During this time, he voiced concern about the cost of rent impacting her savings, which was more than ample for the two-year lease period he was requesting. 
Multiple times, he also expressed concern about her age, she was 77, and her presumed physical condition, which I never gave him any details about, worrying that if she fell on the stairs, he would be legally responsible. I assured him that no one wanted her to be in an unsafe situation, least of all me. Our conversation concluded with him informing me that a lawyer couple was flying in from Sweden to view the residence, and that it was between the two parties, and he would let me know the next day. Again, no specific income or savings requirements were given at this time. The next day, the owner's wife called me to tell me that they had rented it to the lawyer couple, which was very upsetting for me. When asked why, she said they had a large combined income and were surfers, which apparently her husband had some kind of affinity for. <laughs> My mother spent the next several last months of her life at her friend's house. If we had policy like what is being proposed today, she would have been in her own home and she would have been able to keep her beloved cats. This process was arbitrary, subjective, and discriminatory. Additionally, I have many years of experience in office administration, including HR onboarding with background checks, and I really don't see how the extra steps in this ordinance would entail a large volume of work as people are claiming. Uh, and to claim that is really pretty disingenuous. Our system is broken. Please vote yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, uh, I know you usually see me here testifying about more housing, um, but this is, ordinance is another part of the, uh, another piece of the puzzle. We need these changes so more people can get into the housing that we have now and housing we'll have in the future. I support this proposal. Um, I realize some landlords are concerned about the, Put your name in the record, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Doug Klotz. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, realized some landlords are concerned about the rules here. I talked to a couple of different friends of mine who are small landlords uh, in Portland. I heard reservations about the low limit on deposits regard, regarding the, the risk that they have to take. Um, these are both folks who have rented in the past to tenants who would actually not qualify within these standards as, as their incomes were too low, but they, they still wanted to have that flexibility. So I'm not. Yeah, they're, they're concerned about having the flexibility to make that sort of determination under the new rules. Um, but in the end, they both felt that, that they, could, they could live with these uh, regulations and they would make them work. Um, given that we've heard that 60% of the units are, are run by uh, small landlords, or that's the estimate, I hope the city will uh, re reinstate the uh, workshops that they used to run on how to be a landlord and maybe have a, a special round of them throughout the next, you know, system when, when the ordinance is ready to go so that you can get a lot of people trained and then continue, can you continue to have these trainings in subsequent years. Um, apparently they've been discontinued recently. Um, and this proposal will help a lot of people who have been uh, had, having difficulty finding housing and who have sort of suffered from discrimination in finding housing. So thank you, Commissioner Udaly, for bringing this forward, and thank you for all commissioners for supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Seth Denliner. Um, I'll, I will speak quickly, and I have a lot to say here. Uh, here's my background check. Firstly, I'm a human being. I have a master's degree uh, from Portland Public Schools. I've taught for Portland Public Schools for over 10 years. As a teacher, I've not been able to purchase a home in the community I work in. I've rented for 14 years in the same unit and paid my rent on the first of the month for 14 years straight. My landlord is now selling their property, their home, or their property, my home. I understand that, I can respect that. I do not know what my housing future looks like or the cost. At a, a showing yesterday that we agreed to, a woman walked through the back door, she asked to take a video. I asked if I could say no, then no. She wasn't expecting no, this angered her. She asked for photos. I said the photos were online already. She said she represented our potential new landlords and that how we interacted with her would be relayed to them. She threatened my livelihood in my home within 60 seconds of entering my home on a day I was still paying rent. This is the behavior of a, of a land baron. On my doorstep, I heard two men speaking loudly. One of them testified here today. I did not hear these statements. It was better before social media. Now they have more information. If housing is a basic right, then why don't you build your own house? These tenants move in and they, t and they don't move out. I don't see them offering more when the market goes up. My, 
My, my landlord raised my rent $300 a month two years ago, which grew to $340 a month this year. By the time my pay schedule equalizes with this increase, the price will rise again. I would much rather have a land partner than a landlord. My father was convicted of 10 felonies for taking bets for car, car dealers. It ruined his life. He could not be reabsorbed into society. He died in abject poverty, addicted to opioids for 10 bets. Who in this room hasn't placed a bet on sports? If you can't handle the risk or find joy in giving people a home, find a new business. I work, I want a simple life. Housing is a basic human right. In my classroom, all are welcome. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Next three, please, Carl. Next three are Tony Jordan, Debbie Cabrales, and Raul Presadio Mendez. And they'll be followed by 42, 43, 44, Randy Reese, Cora Elizabeth Mason, and Sheena Sisk. I, I can. Hello, commissioners and Mayor Wheeler. Uh, for the record, my name is Raul Preciado Mendez. I work at Latino Network, and also for the record, I am a registered lobbyist. Um, I am uh, here to just briefly talk about our organization and also to ask that you support the rental, rental screening criteria ordinance. Um, so Latino Network is a culturally specific nonprofit that provides education and wraparound services to youth, adults, and families. Um, the Latino community and other historically marginalized folks in our city would benefit significantly from this policy change. Uh, this ordinance would help reduce barriers to stable housing to many people in our community. Our mission at Latino Network is to positively impact and transform the lives of Latinx youth, families, and communities. We provide education services, leadership development opportunities, and many other programs in service to that mission. Among those many services, we offer housing, family stability, and case management supports for low-income families. The, these folks often have a number of serious barriers to finding stable housing beyond their income. Language, documentation, and racial discrimination all play a significant role in preventing many people from accessing homes uh, that are stable in their community. We believe in the empowerment, leadership development, and active engagement of Latino people uh, and the decisions that affect their lives, as well as the rest of the community. That work requires helping these families remain stable and supporting them in finding ways out of poverty. Having a safe and accessible place to live is a key part of that work. In our experience, working on a number of policy issues, unless equity protections are explicitly written into law, the discretion of individuals can lead to bias and discrimination. This is something done unconsciously many times, but it, having a criteria specifically spelled out would reduce these incidents. Make it so tenants and landlords both know exactly what the rules are for determining, the, determining eligibility for their unit. Additionally, having rules as to how landlords can handle security deposits will mean that tenants can have a, consist, a consistent understanding as to what is owed to them when they leave the unit. This makes much of our financial planning and the stability we, work we do possible and budgeting more predictable and will re reduce incidents of landlords keeping uh, deposits arbitrarily. We would like to reiterate our support for the ordinance and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My name is Debbie Cabrales and I'm a Family Stability Program Coordinator at Latino Network. I'm here to give testimony about how this change in the law would impact my work based on my experience in providing services to the community at our organization. Latino Network provides supportive services and case management to low-income families through different programs. Many of these participants are transitioning out of houselessness, are at risk of being houseless, or have other barriers that are preventing them from being stable. This ordinance would have a major impact on the families we serve. We serve over 8,000 families per year in our organization. Many of those families take part in our housing stability programs. Our eviction prevention team alone stabilized more than 400 people. 
Our programs help people find housing, provides them with rent assistance, creates budgets and plans for people to achieve financial stability. This is all made more difficult by the rental market in our city. Making it easier for people to understand their rights as tenants is in what is and is not looked at in their rental application would have a major impact on our ability to rehouse people. We had numerous clients who either cannot access housing or become trapped in a lease that doesn't meet their needs. We have had multiple clients in our programs whose applications were denied due to credit issues or prior edu education. We often help pay for many of our programs, program participants' security deposits. Although we provide this important support, there are folk, folks in our community that cannot access programs like ours. It is important that, to acknowledge that people see their deposit as something they expect and hope to get back. Oftentimes, landlords will withhold security deposits unfairly. A family who I was working with had issues renting an apartment due to not making three times the amount of rent while he was the only one working um, due to ha having a sick wife and having three children that he needed to take care of. If it weren't for us advocating for the family so they could be able to rent the apartment, the family would have been denied, meaning that they would have continued to be homeless. We see many people who face similar cir circumstances in our work. It is important for us to have the necessary information to provide to our clients when we help advocate for them. Furthermore, we think having a consistent screening criteria um, would have a positive impact on our work overall. I would like to thank you for your time on, in this important matter. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Tony Jordan. Um, I am here to support fair access and renting. I am no longer a renter, I'm fortunate enough to have a mortgage, and I don't believe that when I bought my house, I had a criminal background check necessary. Um, I'm often up here testifying for more supply for housing, and I think that that is important, that we need to make it easier to build more housing in all neighborhoods of all types. But it's also, excuse me, I know Seth back there and very moving. Um, so um, I think it's, it's necessary to look at this holistically. Yes and is the philosophy here. This is one piece of a puzzle. We need to increase more housing and we need to increase access to that housing. And um, I think that, that this is important to support and I don't think it's gonna be the end of the world for landlords if they choose to sell their home. Someone else will purchase their home and there will be rentals. They will continue. Um, I'm pretty confident of that. I've seen many of my colleagues who are working on increasing the housing supply here and I don't think they would be supporting this if they thought this was going to crater the supply of housing in the city. Um, I also think, you know, as I mentioned, um, Seth is my neighbor. I'm concerned about a situation, um, and the other testimony I've heard from people is moving, and I think when we look at who's harmed currently, this is an emergency that needs to be fixed. Um, people who own multiple homes, you know, might need a little less consideration sometimes than people who own no homes. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Next three, please. Next three are Randy Reese, Cora Elizabeth Mason, and Sheena Sisk, and they'll be followed by 45, 46, and 47, Sammy Black, Margot Black, and Tiana Thrower. Good afternoon, would you like to start, please? I will start. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sheena Sisk, but today I'm testifying for my childhood friend, Galo Van, who is currently serving a 10-year sentence at a, a federal prison. Um, my friend is a 28-year-old low-income man and Native American, and I know because I know him how much his mental health has been affected um, simply because he is a Native American and the toll that generational trauma takes. Um, as a kid, he took care of his single mom after his brutally abusive dad left them, and as an adult, he suffers from severe depression and alcoholism. Um, everything came to a head for him one week when he lost his job and his fiance um, within a couple days and he just lost it and drank himself um, into a black hole, got into a car and um, killed another person. Um, in prison, every day he feels deep guilt for what he's done, um, for the tragedy that he's caused to this family that has now lost um, their father, but regardless of his own trauma, 
and how that has played out in his behavior. He takes full responsibility for what he's done. When friends offer to send him books, he requests self-help books because the prison isn't, doesn't offer him the psychological treatment that he needs to heal. <clears throat> when he calls me, the only thing he cares about is how I'm doing, even though I know that his depression is spiraling while he continues to serve his sentence. He also leads the prison's drum circle where he aids in the healing of his fellow Native American friends. He wants nothing more than to heal himself and settle down with a family. My friend has a heart of gold. Anyone would be lucky to have him as a roommate or a neighbor. He's hilarious, he's caring, and he's sensitive, and he's deeply honest. I can think of like 12 men in my life who should be in jail, and I would much rather have him in our community. Okay. Um, as a landlord myself, I know that it requires almost no work in exchange for a lot of free money, and this is a property in Los Angeles where tenants have a lot more rights. Um, if landlords aren't able or willing to do a little more work to differentiate between people with a criminal history um, who pose a threat to the community versus people who could actually add to the community, then I hope that they will sell their property. Thank you. Good afternoon. Would you like to go oh, next? Oh, it's my turn? You bet. Okay. You're up. Um, my name is Cora Mason, and I didn't write down my testimony because it, I decided at the last minute to come. Um, and so I have kind of, it's going to wiggle back and forth. Um, when I moved out from uh, the last apartment I lived in, uh, there was a long uh, cleaning list that was really unreasonable, like behind the refrigerator, under the oven. Uh, and then uh, one of the blinds, a blind, and she, they weren't new blinds when I went there. And she charged $1,300 for one blind. And I mean, it was not fancy, okay? Uh, anyway, and um, so that she took most of my deposit, right? So then I moved in uh, to this new place, and I have my daughter. Who's, I've worked at her job for, oh, since 1995, and she makes a pretty good salary, over $100,000 a year, and uh, she co-signed for me, and they said, oh, it didn't, it didn't really add up. She wasn't really qualified, but they went ahead and took it, okay. So then, uh, later on, <clears throat> I need to change co-signers, uh, and so I changed co-signers, and her income was under $100,000. They never said a word. Of course, my daughter's black, and the, sec the co-signer, the second co-signer was white. So I don't know if that had anything to do, but I tend to think so. The other thing I noticed uh, where I live now is they want a co-signer so that they can jack the prices up, like they'll charge you for the water, like they add this person that co-signs as a tenant. And then they make you pay a whole bunch of water for money for water, like $200 a month for water. They make them pay for uh, the garbage and uh, the sewer. They add the charges in as if there were five people there when there's only four people there. So you end up having to pay for the co-signer to be there when they don't live there. Um, anyway, and I think that that was bad and I want you to know about it. And I do like this ordinance that's coming up. It's a good one, and I think it's very protective of the people of Portland, and I think that you should all move forward on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Randy Reese. My story starts uh, back in October 1st, uh, 2010. I was released from a federal prison from a Class C felony. No drugs were involved on that, believe me. And uh, I arrived up here, and mind you, at the time, I was in a wheelchair, a manual wheelchair. And I found that I could stay with uh, city, um, city team missionaries at the time, which is a drug rehab place, uh, for five bucks a night. No problem. I, Matter of fact, I donated $125 to them besides my monthly, um, my nightly fee that I paid there. But 
I tried going out looking for apartments. And most of the apartment landlords would laugh at me. They'd see me in a chair, and they wouldn't even take me out to a, um, an apartment to look at. A few did, but very few would, because I was in a wheelchair. And when I told them um, that I was an ex-con, mind you, when I was released, I was released without any paper follow-up. And there is no probationary period. I was just flat released. Okay. And when I told the, this one guy, that, one landlord, that, yeah, uh, I am an ex-felon, that's past history. He goes, huh, go someplace else. I go, why? I'm a decent person. And he told me that I had three strikes against me. One, no rental history. Two, the apartment complex was not set up for ADA compatible people. And three, I was a felon. So I might as well leave the area and go someplace else. And I thought this was rather crude and rude. Oh, I finally got, got an apartment over with uh, Center City Concern, uh, paying 400 bucks a month for a one, little one room apartment. No, no biggie. I established my rental history, paid every month faithfully. And after a year's time, uh, I started looking again and I found a house that was ADA acceptable. I was in a wheelchair still. And the gentleman wanted me to move right in. Well, that's like, <laughs> slam, bam, thank you, ma'am. I'm in, right? No problem. Uh, he didn't check my background history or anything. He, uh, OK. Um, he kicked me out after five years time and uh, now is renting the house for $2,300. Thank you. Thank sure. you. All three of you, thank you. Next three, please, Carla. Next three are <coughs> Sammy Black, Margot Black, and Tiana Thrower. And they'll be followed by 48, 49, and 50, Jolene Aiken, Kathleen Casson, and Jenny Lee. Good afternoon. Would you like to start, please? Okay. Thank Hi. You. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, my name is Sammy Black. I'm a lifelong renter, a father, a university professor, and an organizer with Portland Tenants United. Which is a registered lobby group. Which is a registered lobby group, <laughs> I'm supposed to say. All right. Um, I'm here to voice strong support for the fair access and renting proposal. Thank you to Chloe Daly's office for bringing this forward. Um, I remember in the spring of 2016 when you, Mr. Wheeler, were a candidate. Oh. Too close. You're fine now. Yeah, it pops. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Uh, when you were a candidate for mayor and after meeting with a panel of tenants and housing advocates announced a tenant bill of rights, one of the three pillars in that document is the right to rent, which spelled out the moral obligation of the city to make sure that people had access to housing and that people weren't being turned away from discriminatory, for discriminatory reasons that have little to do with the prospective tenant's ability to be a good steward of their home. Meanwhile, a growing body of evidence demonstrates that just such forms of discrimination are all too common. Some of this data was presented at yesterday's hearing. Um, I'm not interested in litigating the morality of individual landlords parsing who's bad and who's not so bad. I am interested in interrogating the morality of a system that rewards those who already have so much at the expense of those who have so little. I'm here to challenge the sacred cow of private ownership of property and the collection of rents, regardless of external consequences. And I'm not alone. A growing number of people are waking up from the American dream, a narrative that necessarily flattens the enormous differences between us when it comes to access to resources and social privilege. This high-minded myth of meritocracy that posits that with a bit of pluck, you too can one day be a landlord, and you too can exploit a new underclass of tenants who have no choice but to cough up just uh, enough to keep a roof over their head. I'm getting ahead of myself. We're not canceling landlordism yet. <laughs> I say all this to frame the issue. This is not radical. We're considering mild reforms here that will begin to address unenforced discrimination in rental screening practices and security deposit abuse. 
to the landlord earlier, your tenant will still get the privilege of paying into your child's college fund. I'd like to address a narrative that um, was raised yesterday by some of the commissioners about the implementation of this and the cost um, and about timing and can we just do this next year because the budget can't support it. Um, timing matters, justice delayed is justice denied. Um, as Dr. Lisa Bates told us yesterday, the beta test of the fair ordinance shows uh, that upward of 50% of applicants who would have been um, uh, denied would now be approved under the new rules. Um, and the cost of this is only around a half of a million dollars, if I understand. Uh, and uh, so I, I ask, what's the cost of addressing systemic racial inequity? Um, the Portland Police Bureau, uh, just in January, for a point of comparison, spent $720,000 on a purchase of a new acoustic paneling with a higher UL rating for firing range training. Um, they spent $400,000 on a stationary turret system, aerial surveillance camera, um, and I have a list of other items that uh, in total uh, add up to several million dollars. Um, please pass the fair ordinance. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Margot Black. I'm an organizer with Portland Tenants United, which is a registered lobby group. Um, I have like 10 pieces of paper with notes on them because I can't decide where to start or what to say, but I'm, I'm compelled to share one of my own stories that I don't think I've shared with council before, um, and that is about my mother, who is um, acutely uh, psychotic and um, mentally ill and has been my whole life. Um, she uh, has been in and out of um, jail and prison and men mental hospitals and, when, um, and is currently federally incarcerated, um, and that is her housing plan, which is a story that is a little too hard, too long to tell right now. When she, uh, growing up, when she wasn't um, incarcerated or hospitalized, she lived with uh, me and my sister and my grandmother in the house that my grandmother owned. Um, and, uh, and it, you know, this is complicated because my mother is, is mentally ill and that is a supportive housing situation. Um, but what I wanna say is that she has um, committed multiple crimes, some of them violent, including an attempted aggravated um, murder of a police officer. And if you ran her background check, you would see that it is empty. Uh, she has not been convicted of any of those charges because she is mentally ill. Um, she's not a super pleasant person. I don't really want her as my neighbor, but um, but she is. Uh, but but the point is, as Joanne made yesterday, Commissioner Hardesty, we're already living next door to these folks, and um, and frankly, you know, we should. Even though I wouldn't, you know, even though my mom is a little bit uh, ornery. Uh, I, I don't think that she should be in jail or prison because she can't find anywhere else to live. And in fact, um, her, the, the, in the last 20 years since my grandma passed away, the only two times that she has committed crimes that have led to incarceration were both because she was about to be in, imminently evicted from her private rental housing because she had lost her job and her income and to pay the rent and was actually out trying to find money to pay the rent. So I want to underline Jamie's um, point yesterday that uh, you know, getting folks like my mother and others who are vulnerable into stable housing is the best for them and the best for the rest of us as well. And they already live next door to us. Um, and, and the fear mongering associated with background checks as if you know, the criminal justice system catches all the bad guys and, um, and gives us a perfect prescription for, you know, for, who we should, for who should and shouldn't live in this city is something I reject. Um, and, and along those same lines uh, of rejecting some of the narratives that I've heard there, I need to really push back on the paternalism from um, landlords about uh, low-income renters uh, needing, you know, uh, not able to, somehow needing more support from landlords who are sufficiently equipped to support them in, like, you know, helping them pay their bills. Um, Stark Furs evicts more tenants every day than any other you know, property management company I know of. But, um, you know, so they're not the heroes that Tyrone made them out to be. But more importantly, being low income doesn't mean that you're irresponsible. And it doesn't mean that we need you to help us figure out how to pay our bills and budget. Um, we just need a place to live. And giving, letting us have the dignity of knowing that we Thank you. can pay our bills is a, a good start. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor. Can you guys hear me? 
Um, my name is Tiana Thrower, and I work for Urban League of Portland. Um, I handle all discrimination cases. I work with tenant rights. Um, I have many clients that I get on a daily that are faced with um, just discrimination and being turned away because of their background. Charges, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and they're still in this hurdle of homelessness and on the streets, and as one gentleman said earlier, sleeping in porta potties or wherever they can lay their head that's safe. And we have so many developments and apartments here that it makes no sense that these people can't get over a hurdle or a mistake that they made uh, previously and it's continued to be held over their head. We've all made mistakes and I always tell them it's time to realize that it's okay to make a mistake. We've all made them and it, I'm, this is screening criteria is ridiculous to me. It just it makes no sense and I'm hoping that by you guys passing this, this will allow all these individuals in our community, many of us who may be here today and family members that we may have, obtain stable housing. I mean, stable housing leads to stable jobs, stable families, and it goes on. Instability leads to, you know, the kids growing up the way and then they're set in these same barriers. So we have to overcome this. I vote yes and I hope everyone's behind me on that. Thank you. Thanks all three. The next three are Jolene Aiken, Kathleen Casson, and Jenny Lee, and they'll be followed by 52, 53, and 55, John H. Shelley, Billy Grippo, and Barrett Ross. Good afternoon. Would you like to start, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. Um, my name is Jenny Lee, and I am the Advocacy Director at the Coalition of Communities of Color. Um, we are a registered lobbying entity and an alliance of 19 culturally specific organizations. Um, I am here today to testify in strong support of fair access and renting as a priority for our coalition's members. This or, um, these items would give Portlanders increased access to more units by addressing barriers that disproportionately impact communities of color. Um, if we want Portland to be a city where everyone has a safe and stable place to call home, a city where everyone, including our communities of color, are welcome, we must address access to rental housing on the private market. CCC is a consistent advocate for more affordable housing. We believe in more housing supply overall. But increasing our quantity of housing will not make a difference unless we increase access so that the people who need them the most are able to live there. The barriers that these items address are um, those that for folks of color that have been created as the result of social and economic injustices that have stripped people of color of income, wealth, and opportunity. These include our economic system, our housing policies, and our criminal justice system. These fairer policies will help to mitigate those and their passage is needed so that families of color have full opportunity to live in our city. We have a better chance of keeping our communities of color intact in the face of displacement and creating inclusive neighborhoods. Without fairer screening criteria, what kind of city will we become when we begin screening out communities entirely? I don't believe that that is the Portland that any of us want. Changing our housing policies will not fix the harms of racism. It won't end our history and the ongoing impact of legalized and de facto racial discrimination, of redlining or segregation. But it will give families a shot at a better life. It will help to create more inclusive communities that represent our city in all its diversity. Our laws and ordinances are a statement of our values, and here in Portland, we value inclusion, we value equity, and we value fairness, and that we need to ensure that we have proposals for housing that represent and reflect these values. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify and support. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kathy Casson, and I'm a small landlord with a few properties. When I first saw the screening requirements proposal last fall, I finally came to the conclusion that I couldn't administer them myself as a small landlord. And um, I, I've been a landlord for over 30 years, and uh, at the outset, I didn't really know enough to screen tenants. And so it, tr it truly was first come, first serve. And I know from 
experience how that worked out, and I did eventually learn to screen tenants. Um, I support fair housing laws, and I encourage new landlords who I've mentored to do so and to understand uh, the importance, the inability of, to tell who's, who, who's a good tenant by uh, arbitrary um, measures. I've been involved in helping a tenant who was a victim of domestic abuse. My rentals are at below market rates. I work hard to do a good job for my tenants. And I pay people who work at my properties a living wage. This proposal will have a disproportionate effect on small landlords. Some tenant advocates believe we should not have small landlords, and perhaps this proposal is a step in that direction. In my experience, small landlords offer housing, such as single family or duplexes, that might be less likely to be offered by a large management company uh, that this m measure would favor. Um, small landlords are less likely to continually raise the rents and more likely to consider the financial capability of their tenants, in my experience. The screening proposal will because of its complexity, not make housing cheaper. The cost of housing is a pressing concern. And as a result of this proposal, I needed to, I felt I needed to hire a property manager who started January 1st. This cost me now 7% of gross rents. Um, the range of charges that I found were between seven and 10%. And this is inevitably going to push up um, push up rents to cover this, and that's not even covering the uh, cost of uh, compliance that it might inc be incurred. Um, there's nothing in this regulation that would provide support to small landlords working with populations that have not qualified under prior screening. So um, there's many landlords uh, in my position, I believe, and shifting to corporate management would be for Portland, and um, I encouraged rethinking this proposal and including um, input from the many small landlords in Portland. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Jolene Eichen. I work with the Urban League of Portland. I work as a housing specialist, and I specifically work um, with the reentry population. So right now, I'm working with African American males and females who have been formerly incarcerated and are working on getting back into the community. Um, Many of my participants are enrolled in or have graduated from chemical dependency treatment facilities, ready to rent courses, and are working on turning their lives around, but find stable housing continues to be a struggle for them. Um, I would like to tell you about one of my participants who couldn't be with us today. I wanted to share his story. Um, he is an African American male um, who has a criminal history related to his chemical dependency. Um, he was convicted in 2001 and later in 2009 he completed a treatment facility program at DePaul Treatment Facility um, and he has been clean and arrest free since then. Um, but he is currently homeless to, due to a no-clause eviction from last year and continued increase of rent and move-in cost, as well as his criminal, criminal history that dates back for more than 10 years. Um, if this ordinance passes, this could help get our participant out of the Portland shelter system. Um, please vote yes on fair screening ordinance, and thank you for speaking with me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all for you. Next three are John H. Shelley, Billy Griffo, and Barrett Ross. And they'll be followed by uh, Seamus Look, Mariah Swarski, and Nathan Starr. Oh, where are we on the list? Uh, after this group, we have six more. Sir, would you like to start for us, please? My name is John Shealy, and uh, I fundamentally feel that this bill is evil, mostly because there's I have not seen any provision inside of there that gives economic compensation to landlords such as myself. And I ask you guys to vote against this, because my family came to that country, the, the country that's represented that flag. We came here seeking economic freedom, not being told how to run our business. And the fundamental theory around here seems to be that landlords, by their very nature, are evil, sort of like Shylock, and that's not the case. 
We like our tenants, we take care of them, and when they can't pay the rent on time, we work with them. And the only thing this bill's gonna do is drive up costs. It may force us to move out, sell our house, but at the very least, it's actually aimed to hurt the tenants that you guys propose to help. So again, I ask you guys to vote against this and preserve the dream that our family came here for. That's all I have to say to you. He can go. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Commissioners. Um, my name is Billy Grippo. I'm a housing provider and a real estate broker. So I get to see a lot of perspectives as well as the consequences of, of some of these regulations. Um, I, uh, I grew up in rental housing my entire life until I was 34. My father was incarcerated when I was six years old and he was in, in prison, Rahway State Prison for 10 years. So I know a little about this stuff firsthand. Um, while this proposal is well intended, it's gonna hurt the residents as well as housing providers. I'm all for fair housing and access, but I do oppose this proposal. Deb I have to say, debating for four hours over a two year period with one of the biggest affordable housing providers in Portland um, does not constitute a collaborative effort. We have Oregon te landlord tenant laws and we all have also have fair housing laws. I say please enforce them. Yesterday, um, I fit into that 60% of mom and pop landlords that that gentleman from 1AP described. I've been a citizen in Portland since 1992 and a housing provider for just as long. Um, we have tenants for 27 years and counting. He's low income, retired, and a person of color. He's also outlasted my marriage. It's, it's because I'm fair and reasonable, but also because I carefully screen them for income, credit, and, and, pre and previous rental references. There's a lot of data points, so we don't live in a vacuum. If somebody has all four or five of those points where they have missed bills, charge-offs, evictions, it's, they, you know, I would love to find the person that had a 700 credit score and, uh, but maybe miss payments. It's like, yeah, we can, we can work, but we don't live in a vacuum. So credit is relevant. Re I enjoy watching my residents flourish. I've helped many become first time owners and I take great pride in losing very few um, to another landlord. When it comes to criminal, um, there are many different crimes and misdemeanors. They're not all created equal. So we have to look at that. I mean, we can't just pile everybody up in the same pile like some of the proposal is. Some, some don't, you know, like I've had one that was arson. It's like, no, you're not gonna be in my property. The administrative burden denial, um, I have, I'd, have to, I'd have to seek an attorney. Um, when it comes to income verification, low income, low credit thresholds create insecurity for tenants. What good is it if, if they can buy a Ford, but they're in a Mercedes, they're gonna get it taken away. And as, as Mayor Wheeler pointed out yesterday, that's not, gonna be, that's not gonna be helpful. As you pointed out yesterday, holding up that labyrinth of what you can do um, is confusing, even to somebody uh, highly intelligent and with a legal mind. I just feel that this, uh, this proposal, I, please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, my name is Barrett Ross. I'm a member of Portland Tenants United, registered lobbying group. Um, I'd like to preface my personal experience by saying that I can't imagine the situation I would be if, on top of everything else, I had to face racial discrimination. We know that one in four landlords in Portland are racially discriminatory, according to a study by the Fair Housing Council. Um, I rented a halfway decent apartment in Milwaukee for three years, which I found about a month after landing in Portland. Moved in the place in March 2014, lived there for three years. And I always wanted to rent an apartment in Portland, but I have given up hope. There, um, yeah, so for almost two years now, I've been living in a motorhome, frequently parking on the street and dealing with police harassment. Um, fortunately, I recently secured a parking spot, thanks to Commissioner Udaley's leadership on the motorhome and tiny home issue while at BDS. Thank you. Um, last time I applied to rent an apartment was in 2016, before I was technically homeless. I applied at the Beverly Grove Apartments in the Gateway District, and the manager, Barbara Martin, blatantly violated Oregon law by rejecting my application on the basis of me being arrested on drug charges in 2009, when I was a teenager. I've never been convicted of a crime, 
Um, and when I called her out, she said Oregon law doesn't matter because the management company, Tryon Properties, is based in California. She then sent me a letter saying nothing about the drug charges and claiming I was rejected because of my income, uh, even though I had a co-applicant who was also employed at the time. Um, I emailed Fair Housing Council. They told me that the maximum damages I could recover under ORS 90.303 was $50. With such inadequate penalties, that effectively legalizes discrimination. Anyway, both of Ms. Martin's excuse for uh, denying my application would be verboten under these reforms. Um, I'm a union carpenter. I want to help build the city. I deserve an opportunity to live in the city. And I urge you counselors to do the right thing and pass this ordinance. Thank you. Thanks, all three of you. Thanks. Next three are Seamus Look, Mar Maria Schworski and Nathan Starr, and then the last three will be Soren Impe, Nancy Hagensick, and Ruth Ann Barrett. My name is Maria Swarski. I'm a rental property owner with seven units in Portland. I'm also a realtor specializing in rental properties. I belong to organizations for both. I'm hearing of so many mom and pop owners leaving the business, in other words, selling, due to increasingly restrictive rules. Those houses are being bought by homeowners, not other people willing to rent them out. Several of my Portland clients have sold their rental properties and others have told me they're getting ready to because it's just too difficult, risky, and costly to provide rental housing here. Some of them were second chance rental property providers helping those fresh out of recovery by providing them low cost, low barrier housing. Gone. This is detrimental to the housing supply of rental housing. On, the, on a positive note, this is a win. It's job security for lawyers and property managers. As a result of recently passed and proposed legislation, I'm now raising rents when I otherwise wouldn't have in order to build my legal defense fund or cover property management. I will continue to raise rents every year to the max to cover these new expenses. If I go with management, that increases my expenses by over $1,000 per unit per year average. If I continue to manage myself and hire, hire legal help, that figure could be two to three times that. The renters have been benefiting by lower than market rent by me self-managing and not raising rents much. Now they will pay. I worry because some of them will suffer financially. I have relationships with those who rent from me and I care about them, so this is tough. I go out of my way to provide affordable housing for, for these people and now I no longer can. Regarding screening criteria, some of us mom and pop rental property providers are not equipped to handle people with problems who drain our resources and are management intensive. Screening criteria needs to be left up to us. I'm not using it to discriminate and no one else I know is. That would be bad business practices and it would violate the already existing um, fair housing laws. I'm using it to protect myself and the neighboring residents. Being a mom and pop, I do have the ability to make an informed decision about accepting an applicant with a weakness in their qualifying. I cover myself by asking for an additional deposit amount, having someone write a letter on their behalf, or by having them write and sign a letter about their situation and how they will in, uh, ensure that it won't be a problem if I rent to them. But no more. It's too risky to take chances on marginally qualified applicants. Stop killing off the mom and pop rental property owners. We are who this market needs. We are who the diverse renter population needs. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you. How many units do you have? I have seven in Portland and three in Gresham. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, reading a testimony for someone who could not be here today. And my name is Mike Edera. Um, and I'm reading for uh, Sunia Folsom. And, uh, uh, she writes, I cannot make it today, but if possible, I'd like my story to be shared. My two children and I needed to flee domestic violence back in two, December 2017. I left my own apartment where I'd been living for 24 months and moved in with my mother. 
uh, that living situation became unhealthy and we had to leave. This was three days before last Christmas. We had nowhere to go, as I had been unsuccessful in finding an apartment prior to leaving my mother's house. We ended up going to stay in a home that was unsafe for us um, uh, at, uh, for three days until I could find somewhere else. At this point in time, I was approved for rental subsidy assistance uh, with actually Community Action of Washington County, so she had to move out of the, the community. I couldn't find anywhere else for us to go, and we ended up going to a motel thanks to a little financial help from a couple friends. Money ran out, and we had to leave after four days. Next, we went to stay in it for a distant relative in a very small one-bedroom apartment for two weeks where we slept on the floor until we received a notice from their landlord stating we had, to, had been there too long and we had to leave. We had absolutely nowhere to go at all except for the streets or another motel. So I was able to come up with enough money for four days at a motel, and we went there. After those four days, we were out in the cold until a supposed friend offered to bring us to one of his friend's house to stay for a few days. We were brought to an abandoned house far out in Malala where there was no food, and this friend became aggressive and abusive towards me and my children. We were scared, and I wasn't able to find anyone else to help us until the following day when my parent mentor came to pick us up. Again, we had to leave all our belongings behind as everything would not fit in her vehicle. She took us to another motel where I was able to uh, stay for one night. The next morning, she picked us up and gave us a ride to a motel closer to the city and more affordable. Um, this, is the pro uh, this goes on. I, I know I won't have enough time to complete her uh, testimony, but this is, this is what we're looking at um, when... Uh, when the barriers to rental are so high that uh, people who really need a place and they need it now can't find it. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Edith Gillis, and I was asked to read that testimony and another testimony for some people. Um, tenants who are afraid of retaliation, um, it's very dangerous to be um, speaking up here. Um, the existing program, um, as it is, um, does not do what you purport, and all these um, um, arguments against FAIR are invalid for the following reason. Credit reports are not reliable. For years I had the top number score of all three agencies and a, um, an available credit of one of five credit cards of 80, just one credit card was $85,000, but that's ridiculous since my income was under $10,000 gross per year for a household of four. I paid for a six bedroom home before that with an urban farm with a bad credit score and that was ruined by my husband. I care for wealthy elderly people who don't invest or spend wisely, I mean, I wouldn't, whom I wouldn't rent to since they spend more outside of their housing and are foolish and have cognitive impairments. Mom, my husband took over my perfect credit score and my investments, and he would pass the credit checks I wouldn't uh, rent to him. A criminal, check would, uh, a criminal check would not have protected landlords from my stealing, lolling, forging, fraudulent, uh, psychopath, abusive, rapist husband who bragged about former women in his life ending up dead. But FAIR would have kept us safer with options to escape abuse sooner. In-person sense of in person, a sense of him would not have screened out a charming, manipulative psychopath trusted and liked by others um, to their regret and loss. Our anxiety um, over his, uh, as his crime victims could have excluded us unfairly. We already, um, already live and rent next to people who are abusers, rapists, thieves, and liars. The existing system does not protect us. Um, and we don't need to have one third of our income set aside for rent because some of us have very expensive um, medical, I'll kind of shorten that, medical expenses um, or, um, or raise our own food, um, don't have TV, don't have fingernail, you know, fancy stuff. Anyway, long, long list I can't give you time for. But um, uh, all my 12 previous landlords didn't want me to leave and said I had been the best they'd ever had. Fair helps all of us. Please unanimously pass fair. Thank you. Thanks, all three of you. The last three are Soren Impe, Nancy Hagensick, and Ruth Ann Bennett. Barrett, sorry.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, testify, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Soren Impey. I'm a lifelong renter and I've rented a small apartment in Southeast Portland for many years. When I applied for this apartment, I was one of around a dozen applicants. We were all clustered around waiting for the landlord to come. So I saw, you know, how, how the process worked. Um, and it was clear to me that the landlord was conducting a social economic beauty contest. I won this disgusting contest. And my job status and my race almost certainly rigged it in my favor. And this, this is a dehumanizing way to allocate shelter, where human beings are reduced to their socioeconomic status or even race. And this is the lived experience of far too many tenants in Portland. To quote the Oregonian in 2015, undercover testing determined that landlords gave preferential treatment to prospective renters who were white in 12 of 25 cases, or 48% of tests. Those figures add credence to Portland's first ever audit released in 2011, which officials eventually dismissed as unreliable. The 2011 report found that Latino and black renters face differential treatment in 32 of 50 tests, or 64%. I have also witnessed discrimination against uh, tenants with families. And my complex of around 14 apartments, I have never seen a family rent, even though it's in a cul-de-sac in, in a very family-friendly neighborhood. And this is just disgusting. So I urge you to begin to address Portland's legacy of classist and racist housing discrimination by voting for the fair ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, and it looks like you got the last word. Um, so Commissioner Udaly, why don't you lay out the, the process ahead here for us? So we will not take a vote today. This is not an emergency ordinance. We had planned on bringing the item back for final amendments, discussion, and a vote two weeks from now, but Commissioner Fritz will be absent, so we have to find another date. I don't believe that has happened yet. Am I correct? I, not for a time certain yet. I don't have one scheduled. Okay. Um, and Shall we do that now, or? Okay. Do you want to go to the 24th, then, of sounds like of April? That's... I'm not sure. Will everyone be here? I show everybody in, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay. That's the, uh, the 24th? Right. Yeah. And because uh, there will be amendments, I think we will ha have it's public. Excuse me, Commissioner. Is the 24th a Wednesday? Yes. Yes. Any chance we could bump it to a Thursday afternoon? That's up to Carla. That's available. The 2 p.m. is available. Sure, there's nothing else scheduled. Do you mind? Yeah, because there's often so many things already on the agenda. Yeah, thank you. Thursday, 2 p.m. 2 p.m. time certain, yeah. April 25th. Um, so I, I know I have a commitment at 4 p.m. Do we think we could do it in two hours? Well, let's, why, we why, don't, why don't we do this? Why don't we go ahead and schedule it, and if we need to fix it, We'll all work together, our offices will work together to fix it. Um, but let's go ahead and, and hold yeah. that date. So this would be a continuation then of both items 294 and 295 to time certain 2 p.m. on April 25th. And uh, do I also need to disclose legal counsel that the record is at this point closed? Okay, and the record is also closed, but if people bring amendments back, we'll, we'll take it up from there as to whether or not there's public testimony required at that time. And I just wanna thank everyone for being here. I wanna thank my colleagues. I know that um, these were two lengthy hearings. It feels a little anticlimactic, anticlimactic not to be voting today or in the very new f near future, but uh, we knew there would be some conversations and perhaps some final uh, amendments, and we want to give everyone an opportunity to give their give their input, so we um, can be prepared to come back with a with a final final package. So. 
Mr. Mayor. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to take this opportunity to really appreciate Commissioner Udaly um, and her staff for the incredible work they've done and the outreach they did to ensure that we heard from every segment of the community. Um, and I want to applaud you for your vision. And I look forward to working with you to make this something that we can be proud of. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, everyone who came today and testified. We are adjourned.